Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Arathi Prabhakar. I'm the director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy here and the president's advisor on science and technology. And it's my great privilege to kick off our electrification summit. Um, it, we are co-hosting this uh, event with the White House Climate Policy Office and the White House Office on Clean Energy Innovation and Implementation. So thanks to Ali Zaidi and John Podesta, who's here with us at this, at this kickoff. Uh, we're also really happy to have Secretary Jennifer Granholm from the Department of Energy and a number of her colleagues from DOE, uh, as well as a bunch of my White House colleagues who are making sure that we, can, that we achieve President Biden's big ambitions on clean energy and on the environment um, and on infrastructure. You're going to be hearing from all of them. And I'm also delighted to welcome Senator Heinrich and Representative Castor, thank you both for your leadership from Capitol Hill on uh, all these issues that we really care about. So as you can tell, we've got the big guns here, sitting right here, and I think that really tells you how important this issue of electrification uh, really is. And I know that's why all of you are here today. We've got a tremendous group that's been pulled together, uh, representing all kinds of different organizations, public and private sector, and I think just a wonderful little uh, a, a snapshot, a little glimpse of what it's going to take to meet this uh, really daunting challenge that we've got in front of us. And I want to particularly call out our energy team at OSTP, uh, Sally Benson and Costa Samaras, uh, the folks, all the folks at OSTP and the others in the White House offices who've been helping them pull this together. So we are here because electrification is critically important for many reasons, but let me just highlight the really huge ones. One is we are going to have to figure out how to meet this challenge of electrification to overcome the climate crisis, and the other is that we have to be able to continue to meet the energy needs of every American in every part of our country. It's hard to think of anything that is more fundamental to our thriving as a society than being able to do that. So that this, is, this is essential, but we know it's not going to be easy. We've been electrifying our, our lives, our economy, for 140 years. Uh, and so we've made a lot of progress, but now what we're, what we're going to have to do to meet our goals for 2050 is to triple the rate of electrification. Think about, think about how fundamental a shift that is. And what that is going to mean is not just incremental change, but fundamental change, architectural change, pretty deep changes that are going to have to come. Uh, and so what we're going to do at this summit is two things. One is to recognize and to celebrate the tremendous progress that has now started with the passing of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and then the Inflation Reduction Act. Those two major pieces of legislation had in them a set of provisions that when you take them all together constitute the biggest climate action taken ever, period. And now it is time to deploy and to build, and that is what is starting. You're going to be hearing about that from my colleagues. And I think it's, uh, it's one of the things that has happened in this last year that has given me tremendous hope that we're actually going to make the progress that we need here. The second thing that we're going to do today is explore what else needs to happen in addition, because while we're scaling deployment, I mean, this is actually sort of hard to think about all at the same time. On the one hand, we are scaling deployment faster than we have ever done before in ways that, you know, it almost like scrapes the skin off your teeth, we're moving so fast. And at the same time, it's sobering to realize that we're going to have to scale much farther and much faster over an extended period of time if we're going to get to net zero emissions by 2050, which we have to do in order to have a shot at achieving, uh, avoiding the worst of climate change. And, and that's what I think is, is really sobering. That is the task ahead of us. And that is a task that is going to require not just new innovation, but actually new forms of innovation. Because the kinds of challenges that are ahead of us are deeply systemic challenges. It's going to require systems innovation. And to give you a little bit of a sense of that, just think for a moment about what it looks like if we can succeed, what the electricity system in our future looks like when we're successful. It's going to be cars and buses and home heating and cooking, all of which are electric. It's going to be renewables and geothermal and many other forms of generation that are climate friendly. It's going to be electrical storage. 
that's not, that's still a radically new idea in electricity. It's gonna be a grid that can grow at triple the rate that we've been growing at and handle all of these very rapidly changing sources and loads. That's a big, that's a very big lift. But it also has to be a grid that is stable, that is secure against physical threats and cyber threats. It has to be a grid that is resilient to the extreme weather events that we're already living in. And it has to be a system that can do all of that while still delivering electricity to every person in America and every part of America at a very low cost. Because I think we all need to remember that there are still households where a $100 electricity bill is a choice between that and food. And, and these are the realities that, that I think really have to ground us about what that has to look like. Now, that's what we're counting on everyone here to do. And when I look around the room and think about you and your organizations, I actually am confident we're gonna get there even as hard as it sounds. And when you get there, we're gonna be one step closer to meeting one of the greatest aspirations of this century, which is to meet the climate crisis and even to use it to achieve a more resilient and a more equitable and a more promising future for everyone in our country. So thank you for your work and thank you for being here today. And now it's my great privilege to introduce to you our amazing Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm. Let me give the podium to you. Thank you, Dr. Prabhakar. You uh, set out the challenge so well. We, um, we've got the today challenge of deploy, deploy, deploy. The energy uh, generation that we know will work in terms of clean energy. And we've got the tomorrow challenge of figuring out the technologies that will take us to the next level in terms of that systemic thinking. We, um, you know, our motto inside of the Department of Energy for the past uh, two years, but now really on steroids with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, our motto has been deploy, deploy, deploy. And that absolutely has been what we have been focused on. We have to add 2,000 gigawatts of clean energy to our electricity grid by 2035, if we are to reach the president's goal of 100% clean electricity by 2035. 2,000 gigawatts. Now just work backwards from that. That is a huge amount of deployment that is necessary. And it is also going to be deployment of next generation technologies as well. So while we are both accelerating deployment of existing, we're also, we also have an eye to the future. And so the Department of Energy has launched a series of what we call Earth Shots, which are reach goals by 2030 for those next generation technologies. For example, floating offshore wind turbines, um, making sure that uh, we can do in enhanced geothermal, the heat beneath our feet, what a waste that we are letting all of this potential uh, lie there. And it's clean, dispatchable, baseload power. Long duration storage, making sure we've got at least 10 hours of storage so that renewables are baseload-like. Uh, those are all the immediate and long-term strategies that we are working like crazy <laughs> to achieve inside the Department of Energy, and thanks to those bills that were passed. And I just have to say, you know, Representative Castor, Senator Heinrich, who are here, such tremendous leaders on, on this. Um, you know, these are caps, this is like career capstone moment of the things to be able to work on, and it's so exciting. One huge piece of this, of course, is making sure that we electrify and create efficiencies within the home environment. And our Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, under the leadership uh, Alejandro Moreno's over here. Uh, thank you, Alejandro, has been doing amazing work. We have a buildings technology office, and we have three announcements today that I just quickly want to make. One is we're announcing the easy uh, home electrification prize to make electrification more accessible in affordable housing, number one. We're also releasing a funding opportunity announcement, $45 million, uh, to be able to make heat pumps and other electric and efficient home technologies cheaper 
We've also launched a previous prize to make heat pumps work in cold climates as well, so reaching, pushing that technology barrier. And we're envisioning a future where, of course, industries like steel, cement, and chemicals can be electrified, and to work toward that future, we're mobilizing the on-site energy technical assistance partnership program, because you have to have TA for all of this, to help the industrial facilities add more clean energy on-site get, to get them closer to electrification, in addition to all of the benefits that are flowing from the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. So this is our moment all to work together to deploy, 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 to get to that clean energy future that we all care about. And now I'm going to turn it over to my great partner, uh, CEQ Chair Brenda Mallory, to say a little bit more about that. Good afternoon, everyone. It's always such a pleasure uh, to see groups like this together and to join with my colleagues here in the White House and in the agencies to you know, meet the challenge of the moment. I think you listened to um, our first two speakers, and you know that could be an overwhelming uh, sense of the things that we have in front of us. But the energy and the commitment of this uh, administration and this team to making sure that we find the solutions for these issues is just could not be greater. And so I'm, I'm just so thrilled to be a part of it. I just want to thank um, both OSTP and the Climate Policy Office uh, and the Office of Clean Energy Innovation and Implementation for pulling us all together, because this is a moment where we need the creativity and the partnership from all of you in the room. And so I'm just grateful for what this is launching, the beginning of, of working together with all of you. Um, this for us is at CEQ is kind of a fitting time to be talking about the huge opportunity uh, that ele electrification offers because just one week ago we launched the first ever federal building performance standard to upgrade 30 percent of the federal government space through efficient electrification. And that means taking uh, upgrading buildings like the one that we're in today to push us much closer to meeting President Biden's goal of reaching a net zero federal emissions uh, by 2045. Um, I think you hear the president say all the time we have to um, lead by example, and, and that is our theme when it comes to many areas, but it's certainly our theme in the federal government in terms of how we run our own operations. Um, because we know in the federal government just how amazing the benefits of electrification uh, are, we want to take advantage of that as well. We want to make sure that we're doing our part to, to facilitate this transition that is going to be so important for uh, the, the achieving the goals we have here. Uh, and we know that the benefits will be beyond our own walls. Um, as, as I say many times, uh, President, um, President Biden and I both share the the, the goal, the recognition, the belief that every single person deserves access to clean air, to clean water, and to healthy communities. And the changes that we are striving for, this widespread electrification, to help achieve these goals and others are very important to that. Um, for example, the, the changes for electrification would really help families pay their bills. It will lower health costs. It will help reduce pollution. It will build resilience. And so that there are many values and important goals that we're trying to achieve that will be reflected in uh, achieving this first step of electrification. Um, so you'll hear from our, my, my colleagues today about the big plans that we have to electrify as much as we can in as many places as we can. And one of the jobs that I have personally and that CEQ definitely focuses on is making sure that we go about that in a way that protects and includes everyone, from workers to students to seniors uh, who have been exposed to environmental hazards for decades. This is our opportunity for, our, for meeting this challenge as well. We know that the road to sustain a, a sustainable future must include safeguards for everyone. And, and that includes uh, not only um, dealing with people who currently have electricity and we're making it better, but also giving access to people who don't have electricity. The president has directed almost $150 million towards addressing this issue through the Inflation Reduction Act. And, and we're doing the hard work to make sure that the voices of communities who have uh, the most to lose, but also the most to gain, 
are at the center of the conversation in designing the implementation strategy. And so through these uh, climate solutions, we can help, uh, we can keep leveling the playing field for disadvantaged communities and uh, forge a brighter tomorrow for the future. Um, the writing's on the wall. Electrification is our ticket to a clean and equitable future. And so I'm proud to be here on the stage with my partners and to be working collaboratively with all of you who understand the powerful importance of that collaborative effort in order for us to succeed. So I look forward to continuing the work with everyone as we, are, as we try to achieve multiple goals. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop and hand it over to John Podesta, our senior advisor to the president in the White House Office of Clean Energy Innovation and Implementation. Boy, what a title. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair Mallory. And uh, to our great leaders, to the Secretary, to Dr. Prabhakar, who's given us, I think, a, a good uh, picture of the overall challenge uh, that we have. I want to uh, pay uh, special attention to my good friend, uh, Senator Martin Heinrich, uh, who has been a tremendous leader in the Senate. And Kathy Castor was with us, uh, but for any of you who have spent any time on Capitol Hill, when those buzzers go off and you have to vote, you have to get up and get up back up to Capitol Hill. But if she had been here, she would have held up <laughs> the, this uh, brand new, uh, I guess, final uh, report of the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, which she so ably chaired, which really provides another uh, roadmap. It was really instrumental in passing. The work of that committee was really instrumental, and I just want to call uh, your attention to this report and call and uh, uh, and uh, you know pay sp particular attention to her. Um, uh, I think, as you've heard from my colleagues, electrification is a win-win for the economy writ large uh, and for individual pocketbooks. And I want to spend my time just talking a little bit about what does it mean really to families here. Uh, today uh, in the United States, because so much of electrification starts in the home. Every time someone uh, decides to buy an EV for their next car or install a heat pump or swap out a, a gas-powered leaf blower for an electric one, the clean, electrified economy grows a little bit bigger. The Inflation Reduction Act is designed to encourage every community and every family to take part. On the supply side, uh, the IRA unleashes investment and production tax credits for clean energy, encouraging the private sector uh, to move much faster than they might have otherwise to make those investments that power innovation. As we scale these industries, the costs will keep coming down. That's good for the United States. That's good for the world. Uh, and these technologies will become even more common. On the demand side, the Inflation Reduction Act will help millions of Americans afford clean electric technologies now and benefit from the yearly saving in years to come. Uh, starting on January 1st, that's less than three weeks away, in case everybody's been working so hard they didn't notice that, um, you can install a heat pump, a uh, heat pump water heater, or another energy efficient technology in your home and qualify for a 30% uh, tax credit that can save you hundreds to thousands of dollars on your energy bill. Also, starting on January 1st, you can get up to $7,500 off on new uh, electric vehicles that are made in the United States, and up to $4,000 off uh, on a used EV, the first time that credit has been available. Uh, every year, that car will save you hundreds of dollars on fuel and maintenance. We're working with states and tribes to launch a rebate, pro rebate programs where you can get thousands of dollars off the price of electric and efficient equipment like heat pumps, induction stoves, insulation, and even an energy efficiency retrofit for your entire home. Uh, because of these uh, rebates and tax credits, in some cases, low-income families will be able to get these technologies literally for free. The Inflation Reduction Act is a game changer for families who want to save money and breathe cleaner air to maximize uh, the um, law's impact for climate and electrification. We've got to get these technologies in homes all across America, and we got to do it as fast as possible. In a few days, uh, the administration will be putting out detailed guidance to help Americans understand how to take advantage of these new 
uh, tax credits and, and rebates and uh, loan programs. And we're looking to labor and to industry to help get the word out by training their employees to be ambassadors. We need every American hearing from the person selling them a car or their electrician or their home contractor uh, or their favorite employee at, uh, uh, at their local retailer about the opportunity to save money and get money back on clean technologies. Thanks to the President's economic agenda, we've got the tools to make a clean, electrified future possible in this country. Now we need to work together to build it. And with that, I, uh, I am uh, pleased to turn the podium over to a true electrification champion and my partner in, uh, in uh, making these programs work, Mitch Landrieu, to talk about how the President's bipartisan infrastructure law is going to help get us there. Mitch. Thank, thank you, John, for that very kind introduction, Doctor. Thank you so much, Madam Secretary, Brenda, Senator. Um, thank all of you for being here uh, on this very special day. Um, the President has a vision for creating a better America, one that's just, one that's more resilient, one that, as he says, lifts the burdens off the backs just to make it a little bit easier for everyday Americans. Many of you that have been around the block a long time have heard Presidents talk about really changing the trajectory of the country. This President actually got it done. And what's so exciting about being at this base at this time is we actually have the money, we have the people, and we're going to develop the technology to get us to the goals that the President set for us to make what he calls a better America. He said if you elected me President, he was going to use his power to bring people together, he was going to stabilize the country, and he was actually going to get things done. And essentially, that's what we're doing here today. So when you think about what has happened just in the last two years with President Biden, putting his money where his mouth is. The money that's been invested by Congress and the Senate in the bipartisan infrastructure law, which I'm partly responsible for implementing the work that's coming out of John Shop through the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS bill, which is just extraordinary. And you think about the American Rescue Plan that has been put in place. It is really the first opportunity this country had to leap forward into the future, part of which is what we're here to talk about today. So I can talk about the what for a second, but the how and the who is actually in this room as we, as we speak. $1.2 trillion that Congress passed in a bipartisan fashion to rebuild the roads, the bridges, the airports, the ports, the waterways, making sure everybody has access to high-speed internet. So as the President says, no little girl needs to be sitting in the back of her mama's car outside of McDonald's trying to get her homework done so that she can be the person that saves us in the future. It would be a great idea if she had access to knowledge <laughs> So not because knowledge is the great equalizer. Making sure that everybody, as Brenda says, has access to clean air, clean water. And then finally, what you're here to talk about today that Secre Secretary Granholm is leading for us is developing clean energy, because that is the thing that is going to take us to the future and get us to the goal that the President set for ourselves so that America can actually lead the country. There are billions of dollars, I mean like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> gone to the Department of Energy and all of these other areas to actually make sure that we get that. So whether or not we all are going to be driving uh, electrical vehicles very shortly, and you will, to how, where those are going to be manufactured, to who's going to manufacture the batteries, to where we're going to source the critical minerals, to where we're going to actually put the carbon that comes out because of carbon capture, or how we're going to build renewables, or how we, and Madam Secretary, I, I don't want to say it because you announced it yesterday. The nuclear fusion announcement yesterday was something that it's almost impossible to think about, but it's wonderful to contemplate about where that's going to take us in the event that that occurs. Now, the Secretary said yesterday that that research has been going on for a very long time. People have been trying to crack that for a very long time. Nothing that we're going to do is new. It's all going to be built on the work that generations of people have done before us, but I think it's been left for us to actually bring it home. And that's what today is about. That's why I told you that I was going to talk about the what, but you guys are going to talk about the how and the who. And I know that everybody in this room working together, coordinated, one team, one fight, is actually going to get us where the President needs us to be. So God bless you. Thank you. And I look forward to working with all of you. And now please uh, welcome Jerry Richmond, who's the Undersecretary for Science and Innovation at the Department of Energy. Jerry, thank you. I'm sorry. 
Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I, you know, there's so much energy in this room. It's just we could capture it all, and we'd have these goals met at a moment. So it's just really exciting. It's exciting to be here and exciting to be with all of you. So you know, we all know that electrification is a win-win. That's why we're here. You're not wasting your time by, by being here. To be able to cut our carbon dioxide emissions, cut uh, pollutants out of the atmosphere that have made people sick, as well as to cut our energy bills. Now, my job as undersecretary at, in the Department of Energy for Science and Innovation is I oversee all of the research that goes from the very, very basic discovery science all the way through to the applied sciences so that we can pass it on to uh, the deployment and go. And we are, this is a new DOE because we are all connected together and we are working on steroids. I mean, I have so many people working at, uh, that are funded by us as well as those that are um, planning in the offices at Forrestal. We know that this is urgent and we are moving fast. We have 17 national laboratories, and I have been around DOE and the scientific enterprise in this country for several decades, and I have never, never seen the passion and the commitment to get things done in an urgent manner. I can't tell you how wonderful it is to talk to young students thinking about what they want to do in their career, and they want to do this. Right? They want to do this now. They want to make a difference. They want to make a difference. And for all of those, uh, those of us that have children or young nieces or nephews uh, or grandchildren, we know this is for them too. So we have to work hard. So we're supporting electrification in a number of different ways. Certainly our 17 national laboratories are working hard on this with their 28 user facilities demonstration projects to make all of this happen. But I'm especially excited about the energy earth shots that the secretary mentioned. These really are decadal goals, looking at the issues that we have tried to solve for so long to be able to have clean energy that now with this kind of funding we can actually move on and we can move on very fast. So I'm very excited about these earth shots. Let me just name a few of them. The long storage shot the one that Secretary mentioned, to get those batteries so that they last 10 hours. But even more importantly, they're 90 percent reduction in cost relative to what we can do now. Uh, and then there's also the offshore wind uh, and also the enhanced geothermal shots. Now these aren't things that you just dig a hole in the ground and pull the heat up or you just throw some wind turbine out in the, in the ocean. There's a lot of discovery science that has to go along with this, but we don't have time to have that discovery science take decades. We gotta do it now. We gotta have the critical minerals and materials to do it right now, and we gotta move fast. And that's what we're on with these earth shots. Finding out the discoveries that need to be done, demonstrate them, take them on further to deployment. But I think it's also important to, to really uh, point out another one, and that's in our industrial heat shot that we have going on. And this is the one that supports advancements across the industry to electrify heat production and reduce or eliminate the need for heat from fossil fuels in industrial applications. This is huge, and we have to meet those goals uh, also. Now, with IRA and Bill together, they provide major financial support. Thank you very much for the support for this and for the, what we need to go forward for electrification to accelerate these necessary changes and improve equity for underserved communities. As someone who grew up on a farm in Kansas, uh, I, and the farm is still there, it oftentimes makes me sad to see that they don't have access to a lot of the things that we now have in our cities, whether it be electricity, clean energy, or even Wi-Fi. So we're here to help with that. With electrification, it'll make a huge difference. We're here to face these immense climate, climate challenges before us, and it's conversations like these that are happening here that are going to get us there. So thank you. Thank you for all being here today to help us move forward on this. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Senator Heinrich, who is a champion in this area, and is fabulous. So let me turn it over to you now. Thank you, uh, Undersecretary Richmond. Um, I uh, had an interesting childhood. I grew up as a utility brat. My dad was a IBW lineman. And sometimes I think I was a, a little abused when I look back and look at my, uh, some of my childhood photos where I was wearing T-shirts that I didn't realize were both a demand uh, management tool and then also with some poorly chosen sort of double entendre. So there's like pictures of me with a t-shirt that says, I turn on after seven. 
I was totally oblivious to as a kid. But I grew up with this stuff each and every day, like around the dinner table talking about transformers and transmission and distribution. That was my dad's world. And he made it part of my world. And when I went to college, um, I became part of a team that built a carbon fiber solar car in 1992 and 1993. And we raced that solar car from Dallas to Minneapolis against a whole bunch of other college teams. And I started to realize what's possible. Um, one, how much energy we waste. And two, how many things we can do better, cleaner, smarter. Um, in the context of this conversation of electrification, it is amazing how fast we are moving. I remember in March of 2020, I was driving from Washington, D.C. to my home in New Mexico because this thing called COVID uh, happened. And I was driving cross country with my son and my dog and my cat, and cooler full of food, because everything seemed to be changing. And I put on this podcast from a guy named Saul Griffith, who was able to sort of synthesize many of the things that I already knew about energy into this vision of electrifying America's future. And from March of 2020 to 2021, when we formed the Electrification Congress in the uh, caucus in the Congress with Chair Castor and Representative Tonko and Senator Smith, to actually passing billions of dollars of incentives in 2022. So think about that. Like literally in three years, we went from this esoteric idea that most people weren't thinking about, the electrification of everything or whatever you want to call it, to the rubber hitting the road in one of the most impactful, enormous legislative achievements and soon to be administrative, President Joe Biden's administration of that will change our country and the world forever. Um, you know, my own state of New Mexico is getting $87 million of consumer facing rebates so that people can buy heat pump water heaters and heat pumps and all the different things that are going to allow us to have cleaner, safer, healthier, more comfortable homes, including low and moderate income folks. Uh, I've been doing this now in my own home for several years. And one of the exciting things about it is seeing the folks who come to my house who haven't really been thinking about this energy transition but are living it and working it, the, the plumbers and the electricians who, you know, my plumber, the, the first time he'd ever seen an air source heat pump water heater was when he showed up and was like, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> but now he does, and they do, and they're installing them one after the other after the other, even before the rebates. Um, and those are great jobs. Those are a lot like the jobs my dad had, who didn't have a college degree, but you know had uh, a really quality career in the trades. And we are going to have to scale that up. We're going to have to do the training that John Podesta talked about. We're going to have to do all of this really, really quickly, but the opportunities are just enormous. And it's worth considering, too, that we put manufacturing and literally industrial policy, which was a dirty word in this country for far too long, back at the center of this by incentivizing manufacturing here at home for things like batteries and wind turbines and solar panels. That's, that's an enormous game changer for how a lot of the country is going to view this transition, and one that was absolutely necessary. Uh, I'll leave you with one last thought, which is, unfortunately, uh, Chair Kathy Castor had to run and vote. But what I can tell you is it was because of leadership from her and from our Electrification Caucus and from the Select Climate Committee in the House that we were able to do all this so quickly. Uh, Tina Smith, uh, Paul Tonko, Chair Castor, like we had a team and now we're passing the baton to all of you. And we want to work with you to make sure that we realize these opportunities as quickly and as seamlessly that we get the friction points out of implementation. And there are friction points. I can tell you that as somebody who's doing this in my own home right now. But let's not lose sight of the fact that this is a once 
in a lifetime opportunity to electrify America's future. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Heinrich. Thank you to the Secretary and the Undersecretary and to Brenda Mallory and to my wonderful White House colleagues. Uh, it was really a privilege to kick this off, and um, we're going to turn it over to uh, John for the rest of the session. Thanks all. Have a great day, and we're counting on you to get this done. Take care. Hi, I'm Tom Wilson, Assistant Director for Electricity at Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, right now, we're going to shift from those inspiring remarks. You know, I'm inspired both by the remarks, but even more by the leadership that they show and the responsibility they've taken to implement this in an effective way. Um, our first panel today will be on transportation electrification and the innovation needs for uh, accelerating that effort. Uh, we have a variety of private and public voices here, and the panel will be moderated by Andrew Wishnia, who's Deputy Assistant Secretary for Climate at Department of Transportation. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for, uh, for having the Department of Transportation uh, present at, at this conversation. It's such an honor to, to be here at the White House Electrification Summit. Uh, you know, just building a little bit off of Senator Heinrich's remarks, it's so critical to think about sort of where we were, uh, where we are now, and where we're going. And just sort of reflecting on that, you know, five years ago, there wasn't an earnest conversation about electrification uh, in any major significant piece of legislation. So five years ago was about, you know, 20, 2017. In 2018, you then had Senator Carper introduce a piece of legislation called the Clean Corridors Act. That legislation was essentially replicated on the House side and through the leadership of this administration, as has been said, um, we now have the most significant achievement for uh, really transforming the way that we move people and goods in this country and around the world. Um, and so now, thinking about where we are now, now we have seven and a half billion dollars for EV charging infrastructure. That includes a five billion dollar program um, that's formula led to state departments of transportation. Two and a half billion dollars for discretionary grants, which includes a so-called community program and a corridor program. And that's just above the fold. Maybe a lot of people don't know that the Port Infrastructure Development Program um, under the purview of the Mayor Ed administration has $2.25 billion over five years for port electrification. You know, we have a low no program under the auspice of the Federal Transit Administration that has over $5 billion. We have an airport zero emission vehicle infrastructure program. So we're really thinking about transportation electrification in terms of a system of systems approach. Um, and we're working hand in glove with our colleagues at the Department of Energy to do so, to make sure that we have the technologists um, and the folks that understand what is needed from an energy perspective to actually integrate into transportation infrastructure. In so doing, we now have a new uh, joint office of energy and transportation led by my brilliant colleague, Gabe, who you'll hear from in a bit. Um, that is probably the smallest sliver of funds with potentially the most uh, significant opportunity for impact um, as it relates to the transportation, uh, electrification, portfolio of investments. Um, so really excited that, that Gabe's here and, and we have just a phenomenal panel here with you today. So today we welcome four people you know, who are on the front line of accelerating an equity-focused transition to electrified transport. We wanna make sure that electrification is convenient, that it's accessible, that it's reliable, but above all, we want to make sure that that system is equitable. So please join me in welcoming Travis Hester, Vice President of, uh, for EV Growth Operations at General Motors, Deborah Gore, Man uh, the CEO of the Green Lightning Institute, Maria Pope, Chief Executive Officer uh, of Portland Electric, and Gabe Klein, the head of the Joint Office of Transport and, Elect and Electricity, 
um, of, of transportation, uh, a newly created office to implement the administration's commitments to building out the infrastructure to support electric vehicles. Uh, Travis, I'd like to turn to you first, if, if that's okay. Um, you know, General Motors has committed to make every light duty vehicle produced an electric vehicle by 2035. You've also deepened the commitment to an all electric future through the creation of the GM energy business. What, you know, what's your sense as to the key policy, customer and societal roadblocks you see in, uh, in EV adoption? Yeah, so uh, thank you for the question. And, you know, it's an honor to talk to you and everybody here today about this really important topic. Thanks to the, um, the Office of Science and Technology and, and thanks to the Department of Transportation and the Department of Energy. Um, yeah, I, I really would like to share some of our um, GM electric vehicle uh, endeavors. We have a lot. Um, we see this as really important and uh, we have a lot of um, commitment to where we go here in the future. Um, as a vision, GM is fully committed to an all-electric future. The, the entire company has shifted. Um, we have a vision of a world with zero crashes, zero emissions, zero congestions. Um, we have a plan to be carbon neutral by 2040 for our global operations and products. Uh, and then my role uh, within the company, Growth Operations, um, we take a very holistic view to the electric transformation. We look at, yes, we look at the vehicles, the electric vehicles, and how we tie into those electric vehicles. We also are in charge of the infrastructure portion for General Motors, and we have a lot of investment and a lot of initiatives honouring on infrastructure. And we're also um, deeply involved in the, in the grid with General Motors Energy, GM Energy. And uh, so we look at all of those and we get a very unique perspective across the whole industry and all of the things that we're talking about today. Um, this isn't a future plan for us, it's a real plan. We have done something in the order of 16,000 um, deployments in ground of infrastructure in people's homes. We've done 5,000 DC fast charges across the country in cities and in uh, corridors. We have something in the order of 47,000 charging events per day. Um, we track them, connected vehicles every single day. And we've learned a lot over that period of time. We know what is working, we know what is not working, and we understand our customer behaviours very, very well. Um, so, you know, we have goals as we move to 2025. Um, you know, we want to move to a, a leader, you know, with respect to vehicles, into a leadership position. Uh, we believe 20% of the industry will be electrified vehicles by 2025. And last summer, we joined the president and several other automotive engineering companies, uh, OEMs, to set a goal of 40 to 50% electric vehicles by 2030. So you asked about roadblocks or anxieties that customers have. Um, you know, in the near term, um, they all relate to range, charging and affordability. And we have dedicated programs in place to solve all of those. Uh, for example, you know, we're investing $35 billion towards our 2025 deployment of vehicles for EVs and, and AVs, so electric vehicles as well as autonomous vehicles. We're reducing battery costs. We're on target to reduce by 60% to make EVs more affordable. Um, we're increasing battery power. At the same time, we're pulling out cost to get vehicles to increase range capabilities into the 450 miles for a, for a vehicle uh, on a full charge of certain Altium-based products, our, our battery technology. From an infrastructure investment point of view, we're investing holistically in vehicles, in hardware, in software. Uh, over 750 million of our money we've put in, in addition to what's available um, from some of the programs that were talked about earlier. And, it's, and I mentioned it's holistic. You know, we do level two chargings, free home installs for anybody who buys a car from General Motors, dealer community charge programs, another 40,000 charges in the, in the communities where people live and work and, um, you know, societies are growing. Um, we're also putting in, like, 3,000 inner-city DC fast charges and another 2,500 uh, across the interstates, you know, across the US. Um, all of these integrate some of the charging networks that are out there and some that we're building new, you know, something like 12 charge networks are all linked up to make sure that they're, they're dynamic, they're live, we know that they're working, we know the charge rates, you're really important parts of the, 
um, of what it takes for a customer to have faith and trust in the electric network that supports the vehicle purchase. Um, you know, that's all things we're doing right now, kind of in the medium term. We are deploying, I loved the comments earlier, deployment, deployment, deployment. In the slightly longer term, um, just around the corner, a lot of where I live is in the 2026, 2027, 2028 timeframe from a technology deployment. You know, we, we kind of look at electric vehicles and infrastructure as in execution mode, um, but where we see huge societal benefits um, is, and the opportunity to really take a step forward in this country is to capitalise on the EV transformation um, beyond vehicles, beyond the core vehicle and beyond the core infrastructure. So, you know, we have developed through this EV transmission uh, transition core capabilities in um, battery manufacturing, all the way through to cell module, pack design, chemistry, raw material extraction, developing batteries that can deal with all of the tough conditions that a battery has to do. We're very expert at this now. And that gives us the opportunity to look into some of these white spaces between the electric vehicle and the grid. And we are very proactive. We work closely with our utility partners. They are on the same page as us. We love doing that. But as we go forward into um, vehicle to grid, stationary storage to grid, utilities benefit um, because it adds grid resiliency and lower capital. Customers benefit on a retail level with resiliency and energy costs and uh, commercial customers benefit in the same way. That's why we announced GM Energy in October of this year. And as I wrap up, um, you know, we are intending to leverage our company's skill set to be able to pull those technologies into the future, deliver a seamless and integrated system that, that takes into account resilient, resiliency, lower cost, and um, be able to uh, offset all of those investments. And, and I'll stop and pause there, but we can share some of our learnings maybe later in the panel here. That's great. Thanks so much for that market reflection. And if we have time, we can uh, certainly come back for follow-ups. Deborah, the Green Lining Institute is focused on creating an equitable, inclusive energy transition. Uh, you know, can you discuss what transport electrification means to you? Uh, how can it be used as a tool to promote equity? Uh, and what challenges do you see? Yeah, um, thank you. Push. Oh, there it goes. Um, and thank you, Travis, for saying um, all the thank yous to everybody. So uh, I don't have to repeat all of those. So Greenlining um, was founded in 1993, and we have for 30 years now had a commitment to building a just economy. And we really have always envisioned a, fu envisioned a future where communities of color can build wealth, live in healthy places with economic opportunity, and be ready to meet the challenges of climate change. So if I can just, um, greenlining is the uh, solution to redlining, and that term was coined um, when the federal government and bank lenders drew red lines on maps to exclude uh, people for owning homes based on race. And that practice actually carried over into our built transportation infrastructure. So both practices resulted in many disadvantaged communities being housed and living in close proximity to uh, heavy traffic corridors, fossil fuel power plants, and industrial sites. So the front line and the fence line communities. Um, and with the recognition now that climate change is indeed here, we realize um, its impacts are not evenly distributed. So unequal distribution of transportation emissions effects means that people who are most vulnerable to the negative impacts have the least control over the warming of the planet, and, and they emit far less carbon while bearing uh, most of the burden. So uh, it might be helpful to provide a working definition of equity. So Greenlining asks you to think of equity as both a practice and a tool. So equity is fundamentally the recognition um, that we do not all start from the same point and must acknowledge and make adjustments to those imbalances. So equity can help us transform behaviors, institutions, and systems that disproportionately harm low-income um, people and hit them first, worst, and longest. Um, so uh, all the inequities that low-income communities are facing, whether economic, social, or health, climate change is a threat. 
multiplier. So from here then we can think about equitable electric transportation ecosystem as, um, as one in which all people have electrified uh, transportation options that, that are sustainable and reliable and provide access regardless of gender, socioeconomic status, race, or any other factor where people and places are excluded. So equity also presents us with uh, information that will move us along a path of acceleration um, and expansion um, with an integrative equity approach, which includes climate change, health, and economic prosperity. So data is now available to help us do that. Data science, predictive analytics, twinning, smart data, GIS that lets us organize, visualize, and analyze the solutions. Um, but we can only use that data in those systems if we are in relationship with communities. In fact, community relationship is infrastructure. Uh, the average household um, spends about 20% of its total income on transportation. And if, and if we look at the households with 25,000 um, annual, uh, annual income, they spend about 50% of their income on uh, vehicle ownership and maintenance. Um, and then you have an um, overwhelming major uh, majority of low income households, about 75% own a vehicle, um, but that vehicle is older, it's used, uh, it's less uh, fuel efficient, and it requires way more maintenance and um, uh, overall operating costs. Um, but as we move forward and embrace clean technology, we must at the same time address the energy grid makeup and reduce our number of vehicle miles traveled to maximize this electrification, um, public health, and the climate benefits. Um, when we think about transportation electrification, we tend to think about passenger vehicles. Thank you. <laughs> um, but now, now I'm also thinking about batteries. <laughs> so thank you for expanding that uh, knowledge for me. And the essential part of transportation electrification management, however, is also including road, maritime, rail, air, intermodal, and pipeline, all of which have um, traveled through communities of color and low-income community, communities the most. So by using equity as a fundamental practice and tool, we see that each city has unique attribute and demographics that govern their transportation systems. Some cities are densely populated with um, extensive light rail and transit systems, while others are more sprawling, relying on personal vehicles and large roadways to move people and goods. So understanding how residents commute and what typical travel patterns look like will help cities and regional planners develop strategies to extend the transportation electrification. So let me just say um, some of the solutions really quickly here. Um, start with community. Build trust, identify needs, build capacity. Remember, relationships are infrastructure. Uh, and, oh, push for status quo. Prioritize equity at all levels. Interconnected problems need interconnected solutions. And early outreach and information and flexible dollars, um, both from the production uh, investment tax to um, the investment uh, incentives can also flow down to community. Um, and then right-sizing the electric mobility, planning design for the neediest, promote an inclusive and equitable economy, and lastly, um, be evaluative and adaptive in the management role. So transportation electri electrification, as shared here, offers a once-in-a-generation uh, opportunity to not only vastly reduce carbon emissions, but also serve to disrupt systems of inequity. So prioritizing the needs of the historically underserved to, the mo to have the most to gain, reap the benefits, while at the same time strengthening our nation's ability to mitigate the worst effects of climate. Finally, climate is our best practice of applied hope. We would caution against using some of the old tools of capital markets and industry focus like sheer cost uh, cost-benefit analysis, ROI, uh, maximizing shareholders' wealth. In my uh, humble opinion, sometimes the market can be lazy. Uh, read here, FTX. The markets will, will not fix this. The markets are proven to be uh, challenging, and uh, we think the productivity can come through an equity lens. So as long as we 
have profits that are private and losses that are public, we think we need an equity lens. When we use these old habits, we will actually, we are fearful, create new frontiers of redlining. So with that, we seek economic solidarity with innovative perspectives coming from all corners of our community. Thank you. Deborah, thanks so much. I would really, I would say thanks so much for that perspective, but it's really equity that undergirds all of our transportation electrification investments. So thanks for, for your leadership. Maria, if I could turn uh, to you. Uh, Portland Electric is a pioneer in encouraging adoption of electric vehicles, both for fleets and homeowners. Can you just tell us a little bit more about what you've done and what you've learned from this? Sure, and good afternoon. It's an honor to be with all of you, and thank you to the Departments of Transportation as well as Energy. Um, at Portland General, customers really are at the center of all that we do. We have very aggressive carbon reduction goals, but more importantly, our customers, from some of the largest global corporations like Intel to some of our smaller communities like the city of Milwaukee with 21,000 in population, all have very aggressive goals themselves and deeply care. For the 13th year in a row, according to the National Renewable Energy Lab, we are the, we are the largest uh, percentage of voluntary renewable energy consumed by our customers in the country. And we also spend a lot of time on energy efficiency. These are all foundational to where we are today. And year to date, where about 44% of our energy comes from hydro, wind, solar, and we are seeing emerging large quantities of battery storage. At Portland General, we're not just focused on decarbonizing our own energy supply, but we know that we have to have an economy-wide solution. And a number of years ago, we engaged um, the uh, group that was advising the United Nations and aligned ourselves with the Interdependent Panel on Climate Change so that we would really be aligned. And today, our goals are symmetric with the sixth report. There are three key areas that where we're not only partnering, but we're also leading. The first one is heavy-duty trucks and buses. This is the largest source of admissions in our economy, and it also is the most challenging and so a number of years ago, we as well as other utilities in the West Coast formed the West Coast Transit Corridor, where we have heavy-duty charging plans and infrastructure between the Canadian border and Mexico, all along Interstate 5. We also have a great partnership with our transit authority, uh, TriMet, which is the 10th largest transit authority in the United States. And what they have are using clean fuels across their entire fleet, and they also are running some, a number of all-electric buses. The two of us have a great relationship with Daimler Trucks North America. And thanks to the Secretary of Energy, who spent um, time this summer as well as others looking at our electric island. It's where we are charging and figuring out how to charge at scale heavy-duty trucks and buses. We also see light-duty uh, fleets there, as well as uh, personal vehicles. So we've really been able to learn and to advance in partnership together. The second area is really around last mile delivery fleets. This is probably the easiest to electrify and the most impactful and fastest growing. We are working with designing uh, facilities, we're deploying infrastructure, and currently we have about 80 projects that are in different stages of development uh, across our area. And then third and finally, we're really working on personal vehicles. We're seeing tremendous growth in electric vehicles in our area, but in the entire country, and particularly in the West. And we're help enabling charging implementations of uh, infrastructure. And then for those who don't have uh, access to garages or driveways, we're deploying on power poles charging stations that can be used in many areas across our service territory. It's really important. In Portland General, we serve everyone, and we want to ensure that no one is left behind in an energy transition. I would also say that as a regional utility, we're part of a larger ecosystem of electric utilities. 
and through the Energy uh, Electric Institute, or EEI, all combined, we're deploying as an industry about $3.4 billion towards electric infrastructure, $970 million of which is going to communities which have traditionally been left behind. We're also working with EPRI, uh, the Electric Power Research Institute, on technological development in conjunction with the labs and also as utilities ourselves. And this is centered in three main areas, reliability, interoperability, and planning. Because we see that a clean energy future is going to take new technologies and development as well as partnership. And clearly, the acceleration of electric transportation would not be possible without the leadership and support from the federal government. The investment in Jobs Act, as well as uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, is clearly having an impact. And today, a utility like ourselves in Oregon is working with the Oregon Department of Transportation and deploying about $50 million in EV chargers, as well as their entire uh, EV plan. And then also with the Department of Energy uh, in Oregon, we're working on a $52 million program that they are leading around additional reliability and resiliency. Because enhanced electrification and electric transportation is not just good for the environment, it's also good for the stability of the grid. As we think about the, uh, the bidirectional flow of electricity from electric vehicles as other stationary batteries, it will enhance the grid stability, but also, even without that, being able to charge when the wind is blowing, the sun is shining, and we have excess and plentiful energy in our system, and to be able to use that energy, and then to have it return back to the grid in times of scarcity. And finally, I would say, is that union jobs, good paying family wage jobs, installing and maintaining electric vehicles. We're working closely with um, the IBEW and in deploying and partnering in all of this work. It's enhancing reliability, resiliency of our existing grid, benefiting the environment, utility customers that are using new applications as well as traditional applications, and ensuring a more reliable, resilient, and secure grid as we move forward. That's so great. thank you. Maria, thank you so much. Um, so we have uh, about three, three and a half minutes. Gabe, I want to ask you a couple succinct <laughs> questions. <laughs> I knew I was going to go last and have three minutes. Gabe, the joint office is implementing, I want to ask you two questions. Yep. So one, the joint office is implementing the infrastructure law that is committed you know, to build a nationwide network of 500,000 chargers. Your office is charged with doing this over the next five years. Can you just talk us through the status and what you've learned so far? Yeah, well, this is the most exciting time to be in this space, whether you're a transportation person or an energy person or a climate person, and we're making incredible uh, progress. And we work with Andrew every day and, and others here in the audience and, and on the panel. Um, actually, when we wrote our notes, we had 130,000 charging ports a few weeks ago. Um, now we're up to 140,000 public charging ports in this country. To put it in perspective, we have 145,000 gas stations, and we're not exactly comparing apples to oranges, or we are comparing apples to oranges, but we're making a lot of progress. Um, and in terms of um, what we're doing, uh, we're close to our uh, uh, minimum standards, which will be uh, coming out soon. Um, we have all 50 states, and Puerto Rico and D.C. have their plans approved. And there's now uh, 1.5 billion of the 5 billion that Andrew talked about from the NEVI program that's actually available uh, to the states. And I think with, with the minimum standards coming out, you'll see a lot more RFPs uh, hitting the streets. So there's a tremendous amount uh, uh, happening. Um, and I think you'll see even more happening in the next few months. Um, thanks so much for that reflection. Just as a follow-up, you know, just given your, your background, head of DC DOT, head of Chicago DOT, um, just re really always on the front lines of innovation. What kind of innovation, you know, be it technology, social, or infrastructure innovation, is going to be needed to really realize the vision where people everywhere have access to low cost away from home charging? Yeah. All right. I, I need like five minutes for this. <laughs> no, um, there is, uh, well, there's so much innovation happening right now. I see, uh, uh, I think it's uh, Barry from Siemens. Um, we were just out there with both uh, deputy secretaries a few weeks ago in Pomona, California. They're building a, a huge new plant. 
but also just talking to the workers. Like the people are so excited and they're so, they take so much pride in their work. And I think that is one of the most important things. And uh, I think we all need to do a better job of sort of explaining why that's so important, uh, the pride that, that people take in making things in this country. But I also think, um, actually the day before, we met with a bunch of entrepreneurs uh, uh, at the Los Angeles Clean Tech uh, uh, Incubator. And we've got like millennial uh, minority owned companies operating in all 50 states doing operations and maintenance, doing mobile uh, charging, which is something that we're not even talking about at, at scale yet. So I think the entrepreneurs out there um, are doing amazing things and we're gonna see more and more of them. Um, and uh, payment mechanisms are really important. Innovation there, we've talked uh, you know, a lot about payment and how do we make sure that people that are uh, unbanked or or you know, partially banked, they may have a uh, debit card, how do, how do we serve them? And some of it may be old technology, some of it may be very, very digital uh, technology, because we're basically reinventing the whole economy around renewable energy, electrification, and it's also reinventing the economy, the economy around digital uh, versus analog. And so um, one of the reasons I know this is gonna be so successful as somebody that owns a few electric vehicles, <laughs> um, once you get in one, whether you're riding in a bus or you're driving a bike or a car, it's a whole different experience. You can't even imagine going back, right? And so progress is going to happen. Our job in the government is to seed that progress you know, seven and a half billion dollars is a lot of money, but we're gonna need probably 90 billion, but you already see, I mean, GM's putting in 35, so I think we're, we're like getting there. Um, um, and then one other thing I just wanna mention is um, we're seeing a lot of companies and states and cities talk about, hey, if it wasn't for this money, it would be infeasible to put a charging station in this neighborhood because the, electrif the electrification economy is still ramping up, there's not demand for it, but with this money, we can do it equitably, whether it's in a rural, community or an urban uh, community. So that's really, really important. And then reliability and interoperability are hugely important. And a little bit of news here, although it's not really news, uh, but we are gonna be convening a reliability uh, summit with uh, some of the EVSPs, um, EVSCs and uh, OEMs uh, to start to talk about this interoperability and reliability probably late January. So some of you may be getting invites and that's really important to create a frictionless system for consumers, for companies, so they feel super confident in making these investments. And the last, last, last thing I'll say is just, <laughs> the last two years, we've seen a huge uh, uptick in investment in, this, in all of these sectors because of the signals that this administration is sending, but also the money that they're putting where the policy mouth is. Um, and also, it's been great to work with you, Andrew, too. So. Gabe, thanks so much for your leadership. Thanks to Gabe, Maria, Deborah, and Travis. Thanks all. all right. Thank you. Great. So we're going to make a quick transition to buildings at this point. It's really great to hear about the activity in transport. Uh, the buildings panel, if you'd please come up. And this panel will be moderated by Tricia Miller. Tricia is a senior director in the White House Climate Policy Office. Uh, I'll turn the floor to Tricia in just a moment, but first we have a speaker who will give some opening remarks. Uh, Frederick Ingram is from the American Federation of Teachers. And I turn the floor to you, Frederick. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm a former high school band director, so the disparate uh, impact of that is I'm deaf and I talk loud. Uh, but, uh, so, but thank you all very much. I am the Secretary Treasurer for the American Federation of Teachers, and I want to begin by thanking uh, President Biden, uh, Vice President Harris, and the department for the honor of participating in this discussion. Uh, I'm excited to be here with you, with government and corporate leaders, the climate, and community visionaries on this particular panel. Uh, we live in challenging times and are asked to confront enormous problems. Uh, and in the past two years, we've quieted a global pandemic, expanded healthcare coverage, and created over a million jobs. Now we must tackle this accelerating climate crisis, ri rising temperatures, record droughts, and endless wildfires in the American West, rising seas and punishing humidity in the East. In September, in my home state of Florida, the overheated Gulf of Mexico fueled Hurricane Ian. 
turning it into one of the most powerful storms to ever strike the United States, leaving more than 100 dead and millions without power. For a generation, we've ignored science and spewed millions of tons of carbon into the atmosphere. Every month in Miami, more streets flood on the full moon tide, and the Greenland and Antarctica uh, ice sheets are melting. The sea level could rise three to four feet by the end of the century, and you all know this. But remarkably, a new day is dawning. President Biden's uh, Inflation Reduction Act is the most ambitious and comprehensive climate plan in the world. Fully implemented, it will reduce U.S. carbon emissions by 40% by 2030. We can finally confront the climate crisis head on at the scale it needs to be, and just in time too. As an educator and a union leader, I see climate work through a justice lens. The climate crisis impacts everything and everyone, but people of color, the poor and disadvantaged, disproportionately suffer its effects exacerbating inequity. Pollution burdens children and reduces outcomes. Students suffer from heat strokes, uh, affected hormone and sleep cycles and respiratory issues, which can be traced back to what's happening in their school buildings and communities. So educators are duty bound to address climate change because it is a justice issue, because we see the effects of climate change firsthand in our classrooms and hospitals, because we prepare young people for jobs and success in clean energy future because schools are centers of every community and play a critical role for their preparedness. And now, with the IRA and growing federal, state, and local support, educators can demand that school districts lower their carbon emissions and raise student performance. The IRA provides grants and credits available to cover 20 to 60 percent of the cost for new HVAC systems so kids can breathe healthy air new solar panels, wind turbines, and heat pumps so schools can produce clean energy, new energy efficient lights, windows, and doors to retrofit old facilities and save money, clean electric school buses, and to reduce the impacts of asthma attacks. So we're all in this together, and you know that. Uh, if we connect the dots, the transition to clean energy can be a win-win-win for children's health and environmental and economic justice, lowering carbon emissions, and transitioning to energy will protect students, teachers, and parents from pollution, slow ecological devastation, and create families sustaining long-term, ideally, union jobs. Thank you all so much. Thank you, and we greatly appreciate the leadership of the American Federation of Teachers. As a, a child of educators, high school teachers, uh, I was particularly touched by uh, Frederick's remarks, and it reminds us of the power of electrification across our communities centered in the places um, where we learn and educate the next generation. I'm going to shift more broadly, oh, and I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Tricia Miller. I'm the Senior Director for Industry and Buildings in the Climate Policy Office here at the White House. Um, the building sector, as you all know, is critical to our climate goals in this decisive decade of action. And to get there, we have to stay on the course uh, to cut our energy waste and eliminate the 35% of carbon dioxide emissions that are associated with our buildings. Electrification is one of those key linchpins to being able to eliminate emissions in our nation's buildings and also affordably power uh, those buildings with Clean, a clean electric grid. Um, so I'm delighted to be joined with an amazing panel today to talk about how we retrofit and electrify our homes, our businesses and schools, to create greater housing and building affordability, and also, importantly, reach our health outcomes. We know that electrification is one of the tools in the toolbox to improve air quality and to eliminate indoor air pollution that's caused and associated with combustion appliances. Um, and we're joined, we had a, a switch. Um, Donnell Baird could not make it today, but we are thrilled to have in his place Ruth Ann Norton, who leads the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. So we'll be talking about that intersection of electrification and health as well. Um, as you heard from Mitch Landrew and John Podesta, the IRA and uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law are supporting this transformation across our communities, and in this panel we'll dig into the solutions and how they meet um, some of the transformation in our nation's buildings. 
Uh, we have leading innovators in equitable electrification here today uh, who are bringing those benefits of efficiency, electrification, and health interventions to communities all across the nation. So I'm going to start with Alex Las Lasky, who's the founder and executive chair at Rewiring America. Alex, your organization is a champion of widespread electrification in almost everything, uh, including buildings. So uh, what, what I wanted to start um, the question for you on is, what's it going to take for electrification to grow at the speed and scale that's necessary to meet our climate commitments? And how do the provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act help to accomplish that objective? And we're going to keep everyone's remarks pretty brief because we're a little bit behind schedule. Thanks. Sure. Um, well, I just wanted to say also it was great to have Fed Ingram here. Uh, I am also the son of a middle school English teacher and the son-in-law of a high school English teacher and was kicked out of band before I got to high school. So um, um, uh, don't have me play the saxophone. Um, uh, in terms of what are we going to need to do, I mean, first of all, just to talk quickly about the benefits of electrification, some of which were touched on earlier. But from our account, 42% of all emissions are, come from decisions that are made at kitchen tables. And they, they include both the decisions about the last panel, that is the cars we drive, as well as how we heat our home, heat the water in our homes, uh, cook our food, and dry our clothing. Um, and the benefits are tremendous here. There's, there's an opportunity for financial savings on the order of $1,800 a year, on average across the U.S. Per, per household in a country where uh, more than half of Americans don't have $1,000 to meet an emergency uh, need. Uh, from a health perspective, we'll hear more about this, but 42 percent more likely to have kids growing up with asthma if they have gas cooking stoves as opposed to induction or electric stoves, uh, and 15,000 premature deaths every year result directly from uh, uh, reduced air quality as a consequence of burning fossil fuels in our buildings. Uh, the last two I want to lean on, which are jobs, um, you know, by our estimation, there's 1.4 million jobs that will be created as we electrify, directly created as we electrify our economy. And these jobs are not just sort of temporary jobs. These are career-making jobs. They could be union jobs, too, and they ought to be good middle-class jobs. Uh, and they have to happen in your community, because the work to install a heat pump, to put in an induction stove, to put solar panels on the roof, can't be done by somebody who lives in a far-off city or in Shenzhen. Uh, it can't be done by a robot either. It has to be done by somebody in your community. Uh, and so the opportunity to put wealth into our communities across this country, diverse as they are, uh, is, is very real and made much realer by, by the passage of IRA. Which leads me to, in my mind, the most, maybe most important and overlooked benefit here, which is the opportunity to turn climate combating climate change from something that is inaccessible to most Americans. You know, we've been told, taught a narrative over time that combating climate change is, is about sacrifice and increased costs and reduced expectations. Uh, the reality is that with uh, clean electric machines, um, we don't need to sacrifice. Uh, people have talked about it, uh, uh, but these machines are better. They're better performing. They're less expensive and more reliable to own. Um, and uh, they will improve the quality of people's lives. Um, and so changing that narrative that this is cl fighting climate change is not just for the wealthy or for Bill Gates, who's going to invent a vacuum cleaner that's going to suck carbon dioxide out of the air, but it's for everybody to do in their kitchens, uh, is, creates the opportunity to re rewire and reinvigorate our communities uh, and put wealth back into these communities. They're like today's victory gardens. As for what we're going to need to do to accelerate this transition, um, a couple of things. One is bold policy, which we have gotten. So thank you to the senators and Congress people who led the effort, uh, to the administration who held everybody together, uh, and to everybody from outside who enabled it to pass. Now the average American household has an electric bank account. It's got $10,600 on average in it to help people electrify uh, their homes. Uh, the challenge is that Nobody knows about it yet. So what are we going to do to accelerate this? Is the first thing is we're going to have to let people know that they have this money waiting for them to help them save. We're going to, um, and we're eager at Rewiring America to enroll a million people in commitments to electrify and to tell their stories. Um, the second thing we're going to have to do 
is we're going to have to aggregate demand. These are, this is, there's a lot that's been done nationally, but this is ultimately also a local problem because there's local building code permitting, and as I already mentioned, local jobs. Uh, and so we need the work of unions, of local employers, of mayor's offices, of communities of faith uh, uh, to, to aggregate demand. And we're going to be launching five rewiring communities next year. Uh, the federal government can do more, as they've already announced in the whole of government plan. Uh, we have government-owned housing. We have uh, let weatherization programs. These need to become electrification programs as well, as well as military housing, uh, uh, again, to aggregate demand. Uh, Thank you, Alex. Yeah. That's a great segue um, as we focus on the the nation's federally assisted housing, and um, and I also just wanted to appreciate you bringing it back to the spirit of abundance um, and creating, as OSTP has done, the cycle of innovation so that we're thinking about how do we um, look ahead in terms of the job opportunities and make the benefits really accessible and kitchen table issues, because they are, um, these are improvements in our homes, communities, and in our kitchens to, to truly electrify and to um, make that connection more transparent and accessible. Ruth Ann, I wanted to turn to you because your work at Green and Healthy Homes Initiative has been focused on energy retrofits and healthy homes interventions um, for you know, leading the way in terms of workforce opportunities and um, supporting underserved communities. How do you see equitable electrification fitting into the toolbox uh, that GHHI is working on with other partners in communities across the country? You know, I, I see it as a massive opportunity for restorative justice in this country, that we have the opportunity to get to the crux of our ability to make housing truly healthy, to address the issues of neurological development, of asthma, and get kids in the classroom healthy and ready to learn by investing in electrification. Over 30 years of work, what we have seen is jobs stopped on lead hazard control, on asthma reduction, on energy efficiency because the electric systems in housing uh, is not there. The need to rely on electric has been one of the major problems, right, in this. But the dollars that come forth out of this allow us to do a number of things massively improve health and change our health system so that Medicaid, CHIP, the National Institutes of Health, and others understand that decarbonization and electrification is a health measure. It allows us to improve stability in housing for families, which goes so much to financial uh, wealth building and mental health stability, actually. But it also allows us to take dollars and transform housing departments uh, across the country, but transform communities by having work in the community for upskilled work, not just jobs, but ownership of companies to, to do this work that come from community. But the overall cost savings, right, that we look at also on the health side, where we concentrate so much of our, our focus, we will save billions of dollars in Medicaid over, over the next decade simply by accelerating the reduction of preventable asthma incidents, ER visits, emergency room visits. And so we're working to align those healthcare systems, hospital community benefits and managed care and others, to be a part of the electrification here. But in the end, it's about the quality of life that families will experience the opportunity for work in their own community. And it is, for us, two other things. The ability to get kids in the classroom healthy, ready to learn, earn, and compete, and to improve intergenerational wealth transfer for the homes of low-income Americans, where we have an eight-to-one gap in racial disparity because of the value of housing and how it can be transferred and how people can live uh, there. So electrification is sort of the greatest opportunity that we've had to make health uh, really happen in housing. So we're just delighted to be working in this um, and really proud of our senator, by the way, for adding the Hope for Homes Act into the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so that's how we are looking at this. 
Great, thank you, Ruth Ann. Um, you both spoke to different ways of aggregating demand here, aggregating demand among the consumers and the deployment side, and then with the healthcare focus, both on funders and, and other stakeholders, um, building that community of practice and really seeing it um, start to transform community outcomes. Um, I'm gonna switch over to Katrina Manigan. Um, Katrina, we're delighted to have you join us here as the Director of Buildings and Homes for Denver. Um, Katrina, seen, cities like yours have been leading the charge on electrification, um, and we had the privilege of, of partnering with you last week on the rollout of the federal building performance standard. Um, and I just wanted to um, start by asking you, kind of from your experience, what Denver's been doing um, to electrify existing buildings and uh, what you've learned about opportunities to expand ac access to electric. Uh, electrification with a focus on, on equitable uh, outcomes as well. Thank you, Trisha. It's, a, it's an honor to be here today representing the tremendous work being done by so many in Denver. Cities and states are the level of government where buildings are regulated. And in Denver, buildings and homes are responsible for 64% of the greenhouse gas emissions. In 2020, Denver voters approved a 0.25% sales tax for a new climate protection fund, which gives our office $40 million in funding every year to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions in Denver, with at least half of those funds to be spent in our most under-resourced communities. In 2021, we released our renewable heating and cooling plan. We found that transitioning to heat pumps in existing buildings is cost effective today in many cases. Improve safety. In 30% of low income homes in Denver, natural gas equipment fails carbon monoxide tests. And it increases grid utilization. Our local electrical grid is sized for summertime peaks and has decades of capacity before winter heating loads would cause the system to switch to a winter peaking profile. Also in 2021, the city formed the Energize Denver Task Force and asked them to design requirements for existing commercial and multifamily buildings that improve health and equity, create jobs, and achieve net zero energy in existing buildings by 2040. The task force was a diverse group of 25 individuals, including building owners and managers, resident and tenant representatives, labor and workforce representatives, environment and clean energy representatives. On consensus, the task force recommended and Denver adopted the Energize Denver Ordinance, which will reduce emissions from existing buildings 80% by 2040. It includes ambitious performance requirements, as well as the first in the country requirements for partial electrification of existing buildings upon equipment replacement when cost effective. We promised and are delivering incentives to support these regulations. We learned when community leaders develop and own the change, and when regulations are paired with incentives, more ambitious solutions are possible. In 2022, we began implementation. We created a social equity index with our under-resourced communities to identify under-resourced buildings. We are running a building electrification pilot program and developing incentives for electrification feasibility reports and heat pump installations, at least half of which will go to under-resourced buildings. And so to expand access to equitable electrification, we need heat pumps that can meet all heating needs, not just partial electrification, for um, within, in a cold climate, with the electrical capacity already in place in buildings. We need cost-effective options for all applications. The big gap today is heat pumps that can make hot enough water to plug and play with boilers. Uh, we need regional change. Undertaking a paradigm shift in how equipment is replaced is uh, particularly hard in a small market. And contractors and distributors are all more likely to change if it's a broader change. It's an incredible mix of both incentives, community engagement strategies, and a, a strong regulatory framework with, with standards that um, provide the carrot and stick 
approach at the same time. Um, really powerful stuff, Katrina. Thank you. Um, I want to turn next to my colleague and friend, Alejandro Moreno, who's the Acting Assistant Secretary in DOE's Office of EERE, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Alejandro, um, we heard some exciting announcements earlier from Secretary Granholm. Uh, your office is advancing technology and, and searching for better and less expensive ways to help retrofit our buildings and deliver the kind of um, year-round uh, solutions um, from heat pump technology and electrification. What do you see as the current status and innovative opportunities uh, going forward from EERE's lens? Thanks, Tricia. Um, and we certainly did hear a lot of, of exciting news from the Secretary today, which I'll, I'll touch on. Um, I think the, the core message when it comes purely to electrification itself is that the vast majority of the technologies we need, or the technologies we need to electrify the vast majority of, of building use, um, right now exist, um, particularly around heat pumps, stoves. It's, and these technologies, as they exist today, are about three times more efficient than their fossil fuel-based counterparts. So we know that. That's not to say there isn't room for improvement. There's plenty of room, particularly around heat pumps, driving down the cost, continuing to increase their performance, improve their performance in cold climates. These are real opportunities there. But let's not lose sight of the fact that you, in, in many cases, the technologies that we need exist today. And, and for that reason, you see DOE moving more and more to focus on efforts that can really catalyze the widespread adoption of those technologies, as we've, we've talked about here today. Um, one of these, for example, was is the EASY Prize that, that you heard the Secretary talk about. That is, in fact, an acronym, uh, Equitable and Affordable Solutions for, for Electrification, but it's really focused on making electrification of, of current buildings easier, as the title implies. Um, a lot of work, uh, as well, can be done in bringing down the, the cost of equipment. Um, bringing down the costs of installation, um, which the Easy Prize will will focus on as well, but it can be as simple as you heard from from the senator earlier, of making sure that this is part of what electricians know and and, and are comfortable with, and, and an option that people have, um, and also really raising demand through uh, programs like our Better Buildings program, for example, which works with large. Um, building owners, large corporate building owners, to set targets for uh, efficiency improvement and then work with them um, to provide technical assistance to help uh, achieve those targets themselves. So, you know, you see DOE focusing more and more on that uptake portion and on some of the really thorny challenges that we have around that. Um, I, the other key element is, you know, this was alluded to in the last panel and we'll talk about more, but um, recognizing, you know, I come from a power sector background, and the ability of demand flexibility to provide crit critical services to the grid, it's, it's, it's essential. It's something that really is seen widely as a critical element of the power system of the future. And there are technology elements to that, of course, individual technology elements, they're critical policy and regulatory um, elements some controlled by states, many controlled by utilities themselves, but huge challenges just around the integrated management of load, of behind the meter generation um, as, as a system. When it's aggregated in, in, in across you know, many you know, municipal or many buildings and, and zones within a community, um, and this is a big part of what DOE is focused on right now, including with our colleagues in our Office of Electricity, um, through programs like our Connected Communities, which takes a community level as, as, the, um, as the point of reference, rather than an individual technology or even a building, and works on how do we both create the, the technologies and the practices and then also just the knowledge where, you know, Alex, your point, this is ultimately driven by people sitting around the table. How do people respond to different incentives? How can that be translated back into tools that utilities can count on being there when they need it. And that's, that's not well understood yet. Um, there's a lot of social science. There's a lot of additional um, sort of systems management uh, research that needs to be done there. So these are key, key elements that we're looking at in DOE. Great. Thank you. And I think I have time for one final question. Um, so building off of that, we've, we've heard about the range of tools and resources that are out there. And so I just want to ask for any of you, 
you know, why aren't we seeing broader adoption of electrification? What's, you know, what's needed to, to turn up the dial and truly start to scale some of these solutions across our communities? I'm happy to go first. I, I, first of all, I think we are seeing uh, broad adoption, and it's accelerating quite quickly. In vehicles, it's most apparent, uh, uh, but it's happening in buildings, too. Heat pumps outsold gas furnaces last year. Um, I think one of the things, actually, though, that that question points to is the need to count the machines. By our estimation, there are a billion machines that need to be installed uh, in, in people's homes, uh, from solar panels and storage to upgraded breaker boxes to uh, heat pumps and heat pump hot water heaters. And there's a role for the federal government to play in a number of different areas in helping to count that, those machines. We should have the church thermometer counting up to a billion machines. Um, the IRS, as it collects receipts, can do that uh, on these tax credits. Uh, and so can Fannie and Freddie demand that, uh, that appraisers, when they go into buildings, are, are counting the machines in those buildings and, and making records of them. So more to be said, but uh, that's one area. I'm going to take you in an entirely different direction, but where we work in lower-income communities, it's cost and sort of culture, right, that families across America have survived winters on their gas stove for heat, uh, because they haven't been able to pay their electrical bill or their electric isn't reliable or the grid hasn't worked for them. And so we really have to do a really good job about the transition of those cultural barriers and why electrification works. We want to really get families and communities engaged around the health issues that they will feel immediately, but also uh, what the opportunity is and what the reliability will be. And when we expand that, I think we'll have broad adoption from the consumer side. I'd add that cities and states need flexible and rapid funding to increase capacity in a significant way to be able to do the kind of work that Denver is doing on codes and policies. And I'd encourage that funding for electrification projects should be paired with funding for cities and states to develop and implement policies and codes because that combination is really powerful to unlock larger change. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to answer this question just less with my DOE hat on and just as someone who lives in a house. I mean, it, it, it needs to work. It needs to be affordable, and you need to know about it. It has to be a default option that... that is you know, when I turn to, to resources for what are my options for heating and what are my options for cooking, it's the first one that, that comes up. Thank you. Um, I would agree. And as someone in a former life who was working on deploying heat pumps in cold climates, I think we are on this trajectory um, uh, that we have the tools to deploy. There's still an innovation cycle, and there always will be, but it should be a continuous loop, right, that we're learning um, and, and pushing the envelope at the same time, making the tools available and more widely accessible in our nation's underserved communities and through community partnerships and workforce efforts. We can get there and get to the 120 million plus buildings that we still have to retrofit um, in our residential, commercial, and federal building stock. So this was a great panel. Thank you all so much for your leadership and contributions. Great. Thank you very much. So as we transition to our next panel, which will be on the electric grid, I welcome you to come up. Um, I'd just like to note that out of three panels with four speakers on each, we have 12 voices here that are being heard today. And there are literally dozens in the room whose voices you should hear. Uh, I wish we had the time to do that. Um, and there are thousands out there who are not here today whose voices are valuable as well. So I'd like to acknowledge that in our program. I hope we have provided some really good information for everyone today. Our next panel will look at grid innovation needs. We've heard about the grid several times during the session so far and what changes are needed there. Um, this will be introduced by, uh, moderated by Sally Benson. Sally is the Deputy Director for Energy and Chief Strategist for the Energy Transition at OSTP. Sally? Okay, Tom, uh, thank you very much. And uh, anyway, it's uh, wonderful to, to get to look out at all of you who are here. 
So, uh, so today, about 21% of end-use energy uh, comes from the grid, okay? And, and that's for air conditioning, space heating, hot water, refrigerating, light, refrigeration lighting, and so forth, and some industrial applications. So as we electrify cars, light-duty fleets, heating, and more industrial processes, the fraction of the end use that will be supplied by the grid will double or triple. Okay, so that's a lot, right? It's really a big deal, 20% to 40% to 60%. So and in addition to this huge increase in the use of electricity, the shape of the load, pro load profiles, or when we use electricity over the course of the day and over the course of the year, is going to change dramatically as we add all of these new loads. And this will be particularly impacted by vehicle charging and heating. So if we look at tomorrow's grid, um, you know, it's probably going to look a lot like the 20th century grid. But if you look under the wires, so to speak, it's going to look vastly different. So if we think about digital technology, the ubiquitous presence of sensors and controls uh, will open new opportunities for customer choice, control, efficiency, and of course, along with that will come the need for increased security. Second, the diversification of energy supplies and demand, driven by plummeting costs of clean energy, climate concerns, will change how and where we generate electricity and electrification of buildings and transportation will diversify how and where we use that. And finally, where we generate, store, and use electricity will be distributed differently between the bulk power systems and neighborhood grid systems. And at the same time that all this is happening, we are having a changing climate that is going to increase our need to focus on reliability and resistance. So harnessing the power of this digitized, diversified, and distributed electrical grid will, of course, unlock tremendous benefits for all Americans. So it's clear with the opportunities ahead that the electric, heart, the electric grid is the heartbeat of a complex system that needs to be carefully managed to realize this potential. So to talk about this subject today, we're joined by four leaders who are driving and implementing uh, electrification in their communities, organizations, and companies. So we have uh, Rudy Winter from National Grid. We have Chris Irwin from the Office of Electricity. We have Austin Kieser from the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And finally, Ann Rendell from Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission. So uh, I'm looking forward to today's conversation. So let, let's start with Rudy. Okay, for, for several years, National Grid has been developing strategies and publicizing strategies for reducing carbon emissions. And the, the focus on the summit today is on electrifying end uses. Can you share with us some of the electric grid innovations you're deploying to accelerate the uh, end use of electrification? Absolutely, Sally, and thank you for inviting me to this very important conversation. Um, our strategic response around the grid started with the customer. We said we have to make sure we're operating and designing a grid that works for our customers today and it's going to work for our customers tomorrow. So starting with the customer, we moved back into then the grid and said, what were the investments we have to make? What's the planning changes we have to do to get that grid ready for the future? So I'll give you a couple of examples of some really exciting investments we're making to modernize the grid make it more resilient, make it more customer-centric, and make it more reliable. First one I talk about is in uh, October of 2022, we announced a project to deploy uh, dynamic line rating technologies. And we uh, are executing the largest project using dynamic line rating in the US. And, and this technology is essentially sensors that allow us to understand what are the power flows going through the circuits at any given time on a real-time basis. And that is absolutely important because what that does, it allows me to then move power through existing circuits more so than we thought we could before. That has two big benefits. In our case in upstate New York, where we're deploying this big project, it reduces potential cost to customers. Now we're not going to be investing in upgrades on certain lines because we know we can optimize the existing assets that much better. And number two, 
it unbottlenecked some existing renewables that were being curtailed because we didn't think that power could flow through the transmission network. And it also opened up another more capacity for another about 200 megawatts of renewables on that same line. So optimizing existing networks are going to be key for modernizing the grid and key for affordability. The other example I'll give you is uh, devices we're putting on the network that allow us to identify faults. That's when something uh, touches or comes into contact or damages a circuit, like in a storm, a tree creates a fault. The sensors we put on the network allow us to quickly identify a fault, isolate the fault so it doesn't cascade and create outages for additional customers, and then quickly restore power to those customers. Where we started deploying that in Massachusetts, on those circuits, we've seen a 30% increase in reliability. So thousands of customers have reduced outages when there are storms. And finally, I would just give an example of uh, advanced metering technologies. We're about to deploy the next generation of smart meters, about 1.7 million of them across upstate New York. These smart meters will allow customers to take more control of their energy use, allow customers to program when they are ready to charge their electric vehicles that will line up with new uh, tariff incentives that we have. So it's a really exciting time as we look to modernize the grid to make sure it is ready for the electrification that we want and we all absolutely need. Okay, terrific. That's, whoops, that's so exciting to hear. Just a, a quick follow-up. So as, as a gas and electric utility, um, you know, you've made electrification of heat a key part of, of your strategy for reducing emissions. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Sure. As, as you mentioned, we're a combination utility, and we, we looked out at 2050, and we put together what we consider to be uh, a hybrid approach to uh, decarbonizing the heating sector, and it, a, couple, a couple of pillars are involved there. The first one is around energy efficiency, first and foremost. We can take out 30 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions in the Northeast, uh, with energy efficiency at our buildings out of the heating sector. The second pillar of that is electrification. We have to deploy a great deal of heat pumps and electrify the heating loads within our communities. But we also know that not every building uh, can be electrified and not every customer can afford the electrification. So the third leg of that stool is around decarbonizing our natural gas network. Not the natural gas, but decarbonizing the network itself, deploying that existing network over time, blending in renewable natural gas and green hydrogen to displace the fossil gas. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to you, Chris. So uh, you're at the Office of Electricity, DOE's Office of Electricity, and, and you work a lot on developing and demonstrating a lot of the new technologies that, that we're going to need and that we're that actually we just heard about. And, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what do you see as the biggest innovation needs? Clearly, a lot of the technologies are ready to go, but, but there's more needed. So can you talk about that and maybe how this is changing in, in real time? It, it certainly is, Sally. Um, so the Office of Electricity um, has a, a broad array of research topics that we work on. We work on solid-state electronics, vehicle grid integration, storage, transactive energy and advanced microgrids, sensors and controls. Um, but some of the most important work is the work that we do with everybody across the Department of Energy and with industry, is thinking about the system's implications of full electrification. How do we need to shape our system and really redesign it, as you mentioned, uh, into a form that can, that can handle uh, this, this transformational activity that we've got going on? Um, you talked about digitizing the grid, and that is absolutely essential. Um, but one of the big innovation needs that I see at the R&D forefront is that alongside the fantastic science and engineering work we do, uh, we need to harness the power of our democracy. Um, and of our economy. Um, democratizing the grid is absolutely a research challenge, um, but obviously in, in Rudy's uh, work at National Grid is they can see that, that that effort to integrate with all capable resources on the grid with their customers is an essential element in our modernization. Um, to me, it's a more collaborative grid and acknowledging that electricity customers themselves with their electric vehicles, their homes, and their businesses can actively contribute to the control, the reliability, and the resilience of the grid, and they deserve to be compensated for it. 
democratizing the grid is not just about energy, but it's also about data. And I'm just going to finish on data for a moment. Um, as our society relies more fully on the grid for its energy needs, the flow of information between the grid and customers and among grid operators has to accelerate. A great example of this is a really simple one, power outage data. DOE's Outage Data Initiative Nationwide, ODIN for short, is a call to action for utilities across the country to voluntarily share their real-time power outage data publicly in a standard format, outage data as a service, so to speak. It's voluntary, as I mentioned, but it's a great collaboration with the White House OSTP in the last few weeks. Um, we've had an amazing leap in that voluntary participation, increasing the number of utilities joining ODIN by 400% and now covering 40 million customers across the United States. It's just one example of the power of data in our transformation, um, but I think it highlights how in electrification we need to do more things like this. Yeah, well, con congratulations to you for that 400% increase in, in people who are going to voluntarily report those outages. That, that's really a big deal, and, and I'm sure that there'll be more to come. So, so that also builds on the idea of public-private partnership. So, you know, we can develop all the technology, you know, we want in, in the lab, or we can even go out to one community and demonstrate it. But what we've heard is we need sweeping increases in the pace of all of this, and, and public-private partnerships are going to be really key to that. Can, can you talk about your strategy and, and, you know, how we do that so we can deploy quickly the, the minute these new technologies come along? Well, I, I think we're in a very fortunate time because of the, the work that we have in this administration is the Department of Energy actually reorganized its entire operations to have sustained research and deployment activities in parallel. That's something that uh, we didn't do under the Recovery Act, and we had accomplished wonderful things through those investments. But now we have the opportunity um, to have the Office of Electricity continue to work on cutting-edge research and innovation. We have a sister office now, the Grid Deployment Office, who's responsible for deploying and encouraging utilities and other electric industry partners to innovate out to that cutting edge and adopt the newest technologies and have the confidence to do that. Um, and then finally, of course, we have industry itself through the innovative uh, contributions and investments going on at National Grid, at Portland General Electric, and at all of the utilities across the country. And so that's really a new recipe where we have this three-stage process to sustain some of the aggressive innovation we need. Okay, well, that, that's great to hear. Um, so now we're going to move on to Austin. So we've, we've heard about the rapid growth that's needed and actually the rapid transformation that's already taking place. Uh, and again, thinking about, you know, doubling or tripling the, the grid in, in the next couple of decades. So, so we're in the early stages of this, obviously. We've got a lot more EVs out in distribution and so, systems and so forth. So can, can you give us some insight about, you know, how's this going and, you know, what is it going to take to be able to to accelerate the pace of electrification and make sure the grid is ready. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Sally, for uh, moderating too. So uh, happy to be here. You've heard um, a lot of talk already about all the components of electrification. I know the day is going to continue, but the IBW is about 800,000 members and we're fully integrated into the electrical system. So from the manufacturing of the components, from transformers to hopefully EV charging stations with Siemens, you heard the plant discussed in California. We actually represent those manufacturing workers there and the construction of the projects. Um, so there are so many components that we're adding in, and they were incentivized with Buy America provisions that are priority of the uh, White House. Uh, we're happy to see that American manufacturing is accelerating rapidly to step up and produce the components that we need for the electric grid. Uh, but we also represent over 90 percent workers at over 90 percent of the investor-owned utilities in the country. Uh, the majority of munis and co-ops across the country. So we are uh, fully integrated, and we're in every type of energy source, uh, from coal, you know, which is off, you know, obviously offlining, to um, electric, um, to solar voltaic, to offshore wind, uh, where we're securing project labor agreements. So on the generation side, uh, we operate many, uh, I would say most of the power plants across the United States. Um, and some of these are going to be shutting down, right? So um, it is important to us to incentivize the redevelopment of those communities. And I think to winning the political argument, if you want to ask what, you know, what is holding up electrification, 
what's holding up um, the community, you know, the uh, communities buying in to this is that it has caused job losses in many places across the country. And the White House recognizes that. You know, President Biden recognizes that. And they put together uh, the interagency working group on coal and power plant communities, which we thought was very important. And it's very important to win the political argument here so that we can get past a lot of the hurdles that are holding us all up. And what that simply means is identifying uh, brownfields where coal, where coal plants and other uh, generation facilities have shut down through both market pressures and through uh, laws and rules and regulations, uh, but also uh, abandoned mines uh, where so many union workers worked. But there's a skill set that exists in these communities of highly skilled industrial workers, from electricians to pipe fitters uh, to machinists across the board um, that we are losing because they live in communities that no longer have jobs. And so they're being retrained to do other things outside of that industry when, in fact, we need those workers extremely bad right now. I can talk about that a little more in the future. But um, there are a lot of pieces here, and I think it's all coming together. And I think the administration, for the first time, we have an administration that has true industrial policy as it relates uh, to electrification uh, in the United States. So that's smart, that creates good jobs, that creates jobs in communities where jobs are going to be lost so we're not losing that political argument and we're actually employing people and doing the right thing. Okay, that, that's great. So, so can you talk a little bit more about, you know, the, with all this growth, you know, what, what labor force are we going to need? How many people? How are we going to train? You know, I, clearly there's a generation of current electrical workers which we need, but, but what about this next generation of electrical workers? How are, you know, how are we going to go about doing that? And again, quickly uh, so that we can get it done. All right, yeah. <laughs> so we are um, the largest vocational trainer of electricians in the entire world. We're the largest energy union in the world. We have 55,000 registered apprentices currently, as we speak. Um, about 20,000 of those have been, been trained in, for instance, EVITP, which is what, you know, the certification that, uh, for electric vehicle charging network, right? So we have tons of these folks, but we're going to be struggling for manpower. Um, you know, we call it manpower, but, you know, we're going to be struggling for workers, right? Um, and, you know, to pivot into that, our, our diversification way outpaces um, the non, our non-union competitors. Um, it's, um, we have, but we need market predictability like anybody else, right? These are privately funded. We don't take any federal dollars for the most part. There's a few small programs that we take federal dollars for, usually in the pre-apprenticeship space, which is important. But, um, you know, it's the 10-year uh, predictability created in the IRA for the tax incentives and a couple of the labor standards are going to help us do that recruitment. But we have really three prongs here. We have pre-apprenticeship programs where we're taking um, folks from high school, for the most part, that do not have the skills coming out of high school necessarily, the math skills and the other skills necessary to succeed in a highly, um, you know, a highly skilled uh, trade. So we need to work with schools better. They're sending, you know, they push their brightest into a college education system when, in fact, they can go through our apprenticeship programs with no debt and come out making typically a good amount more money than, their, uh, than their peers do that went to college to a four-year degree. So uh, tons of opportunities there. Uh, military. You know, there's a great opportunity here. The military is having a hard time recruiting also. Um, so, you know, it's a good chance to partner up and say, go into the military, get some stackable credentials that can then be transferable into apprenticeship programs. And we do have formalized programs like the, like VEAT program. There's all sorts of programs, but a great place to, a uh, great place to start. Um, but yeah, and, and then looking at how do we retain existing energy workers? How do we not lose those energy workers when a plant shuts down? How do we let those, we can't let those skills crumble and die. Um, and they, they go away pretty fast. You know, five, six years, you pretty much lose that, the ability to tap into that workforce and put them back to work in energy. So citing, permitting, those sort of things that create predictability and incentivize in those communities where there's already skilled workforce is, is very key to making this happen. Okay, thank you. It's a clearly a comprehensive set of yeah, uh, integrated you strategies. You want, but I cut it short. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think we need to move on. But uh, so, so Anne, uh, you know, as a commissioner on the Washington State uh, Utilities and Transportation Commission, you have a unique window into electrification, reflecting consumer needs and projecting efficient technology pathways into you know a granted and uncertain future. So, so what are your perspectives on how the grid must change to accommodate sort of the pace and scale of electrification that we're beginning to see? Sally, and I first have to say that um, my comments today are my own and don't reflect the opinions or positions of the commission or its staff. Um, as a state commissioner um, 
responsible for regulating investor-owned utilities. My job is to ensure that the regulated utilities in Washington State uh, implement and comply with statutes requiring clean, affordable, reliable, and equitable electricity for customers, as well as reducing carbon emissions under the state's new uh, economy-wide cap-and-invest law. So these statutes and administrative rules, such as new rules by our State Building Codes Council, are driving electrification and other significant changes in electricity usage and generation in Washington State. Um, I also want to recognize that there is a significant amount of public power in Washington in the Northwest. Uh, the Washington Commission regulates only three of 64 electric utilities in the state, um, which serve only 45% of the customers in the state. So while we do not regulate the other 61 utilities, those utilities are also subject to the same statutes and rules as the investor-owned utilities. Uh, to achieve the pace and scale of electrification necessary to meet all of these goals, the utilities, both the investor-owned and the public, publicly-owned utilities, uh, will need to make significant investments in both the distribution grid and the bulk power system, in addition to generation and transmission. And I'm going to speak specifically to the, to the distribution grid. Utilities are going to have to make significant investments in several ways. First, in the grid management systems, and Rudy spoke a bit about that. Systems that are necessary to provide visibility into and the flexible management of demand that's resulting from the changes in climate, in customer-owned variable generation, and usage due to transportation and building electrification, as well as increased demand response. Second, they're going to need to make investment in reliability and resilience through more locally sourced and distributed generation, including long-term storage, microgrids, grid hardening, as greater reliance on electricity for transportation and buildings means more of a customer impact with economic and, more importantly, life and death consequences if the power goes out or is unreliable. And third, um, Similar to what uh, Deborah Gorman of the Green Lining Institute said earlier, we're going to have to make those investments in under-resourced and impacted communities to ensure that those communities and the customers also see the benefits of electrification and a clean energy economy, as well as a reduction in their current impacts. Through investments in local clean resources, weatherization, energy efficiency, and job training and employment. We do this by applying an equity lens to our work, and we're working on doing that at the Commission and using tools and data to identify um, the current baseline impact and uh, what investments we can make that, that best um, address that impact. So the funds and the tax incentives available from uh, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act and the Inflation Reduction Act are going to help make many of these invest investments more affordable to customers if the utilities take advantage of those, um, of those funds, because those funds can help reduce the cost impact of the investments that the utilities will make. Um, so I'll stop there. I know you have some other thoughts. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so there we go. Thank you. Um, so, so earlier we heard about, you know, the pairing between incentives and regulations and, and how powerful that could be. And I thought that was a very uh, terrific comment. Um, question for you is, how do you see the role of regulators in, in enabling progress? You know, what's the unique role and how can that be synergistic with all of the other uh, actors in this situation? Right. As I said, our role is to, um, at least in Washington, is to focus on uh, equitable, affordable, and reliable service to customers so that all customers uh, receive the benefits of these investments, that electricity is affordable for all customers, and that electricity is available when it's needed. In, in Washington, specifically, the Clean Energy Transformation Act requires that all customers benefit from that transition. So we're working to ensure that the utilities, when they're making these investments, they focus on customer benefit, applying that equity lens, uh, using tools similar to the Justice 40 initiative uh, and requiring utilities to work with communities through equity advisory groups uh, so that they can make sure the communities can help determine what is the most benefit for them instead of trying to determine from the top what benefit uh, should be for those communities. We're also focused on um, innovation in our regulation and figuring out what are the appropriate incentives for investment through evaluating 
our processes and the details of current regulation, including performance-based mechanisms, uh, performance measures, incentive mechanisms, using multi-year rate plans, and allowing for quicker recovery of investment subject to later and more complete prudence reviews and possible customer refunds if appropriate. So that kind of gets into those wonky details of regulation, but, that, but we need to be flexible as well in trying to push through these funds and make these changes that are necessary to the grid uh, to benefit the customers um, and make sure that the power is clean, reliable, affordable, and equitable. Okay, thank you. So, so now we're going to move to the part of this where I'm just going to throw out a question and anybody can answer it. Uh, so, you know, we know we have heat pumps. We know we can make EVs. You know, a lot of the components are done. But I think that, in my mind, the challenge of electrification is really the systems level challenges. And there are many actors. Um, but in these systems challenges, you can end the chicken and the egg problem, right? That uh, So we here we have consumers, commissioners, utilities, building standards, and so on. And all of these things are going to interact. And just to give a, an example that, you know, a, a utility commission may not want to pay for upgrades to the grid until there's a large, clear demand signal that it's like, okay, we're going to go ahead and do this. On the other hand, customers, you know, if they start hearing, oh gosh, my neighbor, you know, didn't really work out for them because the grid wasn't quite wetty, you know, we're really going to end up with a chicken and egg problem. So how, do, you know, this is a solvable problem. So what are your best ideas on, on, on how we avoid this? I'll, uh, I'll start because I have to build everything we're talking about. <laughs> and uh, there's a fine line between just in time and being late. And we don't want the grid to be late. It has to be an enabler for this entire energy transition and not slow it down. So to do that, what I think we all need to do, government, utilities, regulators, our partners in, in organized labor and consumers have to change the planning paradigm. And we have to move from a reactive planning paradigm to one that's very deliberate, very proactive, looking at long-term planning that's tied to our climate change goals that we all uh, need to hit. Um, we're going to have to plan and build our way through that uncertainty. Okay, others, yeah. I'll, I'll jump in and just kind of double down. Just like with the consumer argument, I was talking about the coal plants, um, the coal communities and others. Um, it's important that we win the political argument here. You know, we can't get past that hump of offlining uh, power plants if we're not replacing those jobs with industrial jobs that are competitive on wages and the skills that workers already know. So we see pushback, and we've only seen pushback. And in fact, I think we had a false start here for a long time that I think the Biden administration has helped clean up, where we shut down power plants irregardless of what the economic impacts were to the communities that we left behind. And, we, and there was a lot of destruction. So we have to have a smarter industrial policy, and that's happening. But also the workforce has to look like the communities. And we've, uh, we've been very focused on diversity in our apprenticeship programs. In fact, in the last five years, we've increased uh, our minority men by 75% in our apprenticeships. So out of these 55,000, uh, we've dramatically increased. One in three of our active uh, male apprentices identifies minority. So it's dramatically increased and well ahead of um, our non-union competitors. So we're leading the way and through things, the market pred predictability, project labor agreements, other things, labor standards that have been incentivized, it allows us to speed up that process and diversify even more. But 83% of our apprentices, for instance, in our largest Western apprenticeship program are minority, people of color, right? So um, we're, we've doubled the number of black and Hispanic members and a quarter of all of our black members are females, right? So we're, we're leading the way and we wanna make sure that communities that the workforce reflects the communities they live in and are also, uh, we're re-industrializing industrialized facilities with the new industries that we're bringing, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's power generation, uh, to feed the electric grid and make sure the communities win and revitalize under these plans. So. And I, I double down on the planning. I think we have to focus less on historical planning and planning more for both what's coming but also the climate impacts and we know what's changing in the climate, so we can't go on historical weather, weather patterns. We have to look at future weather patterns and look at the impacts to communities. And they're not just for electrical workers, but there are workers in the natural gas system that we have to pay attention to and help them transition. Maybe there's some good jobs in the electrical side. They can do some training. So we have to you know, make sure that the impacts as we're electrifying, there will be impacts to the natural gas system. Even if we're using renewable natural gas and hydrogen, we have to look at, uh, at that, at the labor, as well as the planning for the grid. 
I'll guess I'll just finish it up as to say it's like, yes, it is a systemic issue, and we need to find that way forward through better planning processes. But finally is, I mean, this decarbonized and equitable grid that serves all of our energy needs, it, it can't just be a physics problem. It has to have those socioeconomic dimensions so that everybody gets that win moving into a future that they're happy to arrive at. And that, that applies to all the stakeholders we have here. Okay, well, thank you. I, I feel we have a tremendous amount of wisdom and knowledge imparted in a really short time, so thank you so much. Great. So before we go to our closing panel, I'd like to welcome Representative Sean Kasten from Illinois. Uh, I think most of you know Representative Kasten. He's an expert in the electric field. Uh, really, really glad he get here, and they're on a 15-minute recess right now, which he, <laughs> which he said would either last 15 minutes or four hours, and so uh, I'm not sure how long his presentation will be. <laughs> Thank you all so much for having me. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the House will not continue until they know that I'm back, um, the, uh, but uh, thanks so much for having me. Delighted to be here and appreciate you shuffling the schedule a little bit. Um, so. I, I thought I'd start just by telling a little bit of story. I, before I came to Congress, I was 20 years in the clean energy world, um, 16 of them doing behind the fence, cogen and, and running other, but always clean energy on the back end. And don't ask me when, because it'll date me. It was probably more than 15 years ago. We built a little small 500 kilowatt cogen plant in, in northern Vermont. And with about $1,000 worth of parts, we were able to do remote dispatch on that generator so that we could, we could run in response to variable loads. And I had this reporter who asked me afterwards, this is amazing. It's a smart grid of the future. You can do this remote monitoring. What is the technological innovation that made this happen? And I said, this was $1,000 worth of parts that we bought at Radio Shack. <laughs> what changed in the moment was not the technology, but that New England had just created the forward capacity markets, <clears throat> and all of a sudden, the, the grid was rewarding people for investing in things that benefited the grid instead of just investing in things that benefited us. And, I, and okay, 500 kilowatts, I'm not going to take credit for that, keeping the lights on in New England. But, but about four or five years later, when the Yankee nuclear plant shut down in New England, in that intervening period, 2,000 megawatts, 2 gigawatts of demand-side reduction had been brought on the grid. And when I talked to my friends at ISO New England, they said, you know, the reason that we were able to shut down the largest single generator in New England and not worry about the lights going out was because all of this demand side resources had been brought forward. Now, not all of it proved out. We all know the story about demand side resources, but the lights stayed on. And I, and I tell that story because we absolutely cannot decarbonize, meet our decarbonization goals, and I'm sure that every speaker here has said that in various degrees, without massively electrifying our system, building a ton of clean electricity generation, and some of that requires technological innovation, which I don't want to dismiss at all. There are cooler things out there than the $1,000 worth of stuff that we bought at Radio Shack. But a lot of that also requires regulatory innovation. And we got to do it both on both sides. And I, I often think that our challenge in Congress, as I said at a press event this morning, I've been in Congress now for four years. I have yet to have anybody come into my office and say, you know what the problem is with our industry is it's way too hard for my competitors to succeed. <laughs> right? And so as we bring these resources forward that are cheaper, that are cleaner, the incumbents are not going to ask for them, but we have to figure out how to make the regulatory reforms to bring them forward. So on a technology level, don't lose sight. I mean, my goodness, you know, all the pieces from reconductoring to high voltage DC, all the storage technologies, all the smart devices, we need all of those. But I was going through, I'm on the SEEK Power Sector Task Force, and I was looking at all the things that we have either sent letters or asked in the last term. Minimum transfer capability, demand response opt-out, um, misuse of ratepayer funds for lobbying, RTO stakeholder reform, having DOE do an analysis to figure out where our grid is going to be capacity constrained because of the development of electric vehicles and charging rollout, um, having FERC take up rules on interconnection queue reform, interregional transmission, and then finally funding for advanced conductoring and other technologies. Most of those are regulatory reforms, right? And I'm not saying we're right, but that's the place we gotta go. So we need the regulatory innovation, we need the other side of that. And I think more generally, the challenge that, that I think we all face is there is 
I used to run a coal plant. I used to run a gas plant. If you run a coal plant, you go to bed every night waiting for your fuel dispatcher to tell you what the forward market is for power the next day and whether, what your coal prices are and whether or not it makes sense to run. There is not a single person who owns a solar panel who waits for that report before going to bed at night, <laughs> right? Or a wind turbine, or for that matter, a nuclear plant. And so we're bringing all these resources forward that have zero marginal cost. And I think our larger regulatory challenge is we've, we've electrified the country, we've built a grid, we've developed a whole dispatch model based on the idea that we have fuel generators that will dispatch in response to a marginal price signal and optimize in response to whatever the load happens to be doing. And we now have to figure out how to design a system that says we got a bunch of zero cost generators that have no economic signal to operate, but we've got a lot of downstream demand actions, we've got a lot of intermediate capacities with respect to storage that can modulate and respond in response to some variability on the generation side. And these are solvable problems. We're smart people in this room. Um, but I think that's our challenge is to rethink how does the regulatory structure work to make sure that we, we take advantage of the fact that all these technologies are cleaner, cheaper, and in aggregate more reliable, but we've got to have the system control. So I, I thank you for having me here. I thank you for doing all of these things. I thank you for pushing ultimately to democratize our power system. And, um, and I wish I could talk longer, but I will instead take the opportunity to turn this over to the OSTP Deputy Director, Sally Benson. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you, Representative Kasten. It may be a short time, but uh, it was uh, it really meant a lot from, for us to have you here. So, uh, so you know, wow, what an electrifying event! Um, <laughs> and but but really, what I think is so exciting is just to hear the tremendous alignment that we heard today by our administration leaders, by the Congress, by by people in transportation and buildings and the electric grid that, you know, we're all working uh, together towards the same thing. So that's really encouraging. And, and I just want to also give a shout out to something that happened uh, last week that you heard a lot about, uh, you know, and that's the historic scientific breakthrough in fusion that was announced by the Department of Energy yesterday. So, uh, so as many of you know, scientists crushed previous records and for the first time exceeded scientific break even energy, opening the door to entirely new possibilities in fusion. So that happened about nine months ago to the day from the time that we held the first ever White House Fusion Summit, okay, last March, okay? So I don't wanna put any pressure on you, <laughs> but I'm just saying I can't wait to hear about your accomplishments nine months from now in the area of electrification. So now in all seriousness, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today, to our speakers, uh, those of you in the room, to those of you who joined us on live stream, I'd uh, also like to thank our administration leaders and members of Congress who've shown such tremendous leadership in inclusive electrification, the clean energy transition, and our ongoing fight to tackle the climate crisis. Of course, the historic investments created by the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law provide this once in a generation opportunity for a nationwide upgrade to our energy system, our homes, and transportation. And President Biden has mobilized every federal agency to implement these laws, putting on, on the path to meet our climate commitments, lower the costs for households, make our energy system more equitable, and future-proof our infrastructure. So now our job here is to step on the accelerator. And from what I heard today, I'm really confident that this is the case. So the combination of a zero emission grid, electrification is one of five priorities for the Net Zero Game Changers Initiative, a new cross-agency research and development initiative to ensure that all the technologies, including the ones we heard about today, needed to meet our 2050 net zero goals are ready to scale. So Americans have a long track record of electricity innovation. So in fact, ele electricity pioneer Thomas Edison worked in the White House during World War I, and he actually was just one floor down from us, right? Really amazing, right? 
And, and just like today, this is really incredible, he pulled together a team of experts from across the country to ask the public for their ideas about how science and technology innovation could make our nation stronger and more secure. So now, again, we need electricity innovation from Edison, California to Edison, New Jersey. And we've done this before, too. But we have to realize it's not just about technology innovation. We've heard a lot about that. Access to innovation is just as important, so we make sure that we create opportunities for everyone. So if we look a century ago, the federal government worked closely with states and communities to rapidly electrify farms in rural areas and quickly improve people's lives. So today we're bringing that same speed and intention to homes, businesses, to transportations to go electric and leaving nobody behind as we do it. So of course, this isn't going to be easy. It's wonderful to have the alignment. Uh, and we have a lot of work to do, though. So in addition to technology innovation, we need systems innovation and experiment. We need to go out and be bold, try things, see what works, and do more of that, and stop doing the things that aren't working. And the key here is to have all the parts work together, cars, space heating, hot water, air conditioning, and all the other things we use electricity for. We need to, to work together seamlessly, efficiently, and reliability, because they're all going to be sharing the exact same electricity infrastructure. And of course, systems innovation goes beyond technology innovation. We also need business innovation, finance innovation, regulatory innovation to provide people-centered solutions that work for everyone. So over the coming months, the federal agencies will be working together to develop bold goals and an action plan to support widespread and rapid electrification. And of course, the prize is great. Cleaner air, a stable climate, more affordable energy bills, more energy security, but not just for the United States, but around the world, and really reimagining a backbone for the 21st century energy system. That's the promise of electrification. So in the words of our fantastic OSTP director, Prabhakar, we need to increase the speed and scale of electrification so the climate takes notice. And to do this will require climate scale innovation. So thank you for joining us in what we hope is the first of many conversations. And I will now turn this over to my great colleague and friend, the National Climate Advisor and leader of the Domestic Climate Office, Ali Zaidi to close out today's events. Thank you, Dr. Benson. Um, we are so lucky to have the kind of talent we have in the Biden administration. Uh, and, and Sally Benson is a great example of the kind of wicked smart people uh, that have chosen to, to sign up and, and help us solve, um, I think, the hardest set of challenges that we face. Um, so, you know, we're, we're here at the Electrification Summit, and um, my message to you is, is, is the same uh, that it is to every sector and every strategy that we have um, in taking on the climate crisis, that the motivating thesis in the Biden administration is that we are in the decisive decade for climate action, and that's not something we choose for ourselves, it's something that science uh, dictates um, in 2018. Uh, as this campaign uh, has, uh, was sort of coming uh, into sort of concept, um, we were buttressed on one side by an IPCC report that could not be more clear. And you don't have to flip through the pages of a scientific report. You can see it in our communities, in the fires, and in the floods, and the droughts, and in the hurricanes. This is a reality that we face. And it's not just a story of gloom and doom. It's a story of hope and opportunity if we are wise enough to go seek it. And what does the decade of decisiveness mean? Uh, what it means is delivery. And that means you can't, if you're a business, this is not the moment to launch a committee of your board of directors to look at the challenge. Uh, this is the time to green light capital projects. Um, if you are a member of the legislature and you, hear, you heard from some of our leaders here today, uh, this is not the time for uh, committees to convene 
hearings upon hearings. It's the time to take bold action, and this Congress has delivered just that through the infrastructure law, through the CHIPS and Science Act, through the Inflation Reduction Act, a gigaton of emissions potential that we must now seize. For folks in academia and advocacy, we've got to run our hearts out in this moment. This is the moment of truth, and there are a lot of folks who, by the way, made the politics for this moment possible, right? The young people marching on Fridays and other days, taken to the streets. They're really skeptical that we're going to deliver. There's a real erosion of trust because there's been a dereliction of duty over the course of decades. I was born the first year this planet breached 350 parts per million. And since then, there's been talk and talk and talk. So the decisive decade needs to mean steel in the ground. And that's the only way we're going to build trust and confidence that we're going to actually move in the direction that this moment demands. That is the guiding principle of the Biden climate program. <clears throat> and if there's any question of how we do this, the president has been absolutely clear. It has to be in a way that codes really into the DNA of the climate program, a focus on workers and communities. I see labor leaders in the audience, and that's probably not a surprise if you've ever been to a Biden-Harris administration gathering. But this is not just about putting steel in the ground for clean energy technologies. This can be the moment where we put steel in the spine of the American middle class. And the way we know how to do that is by investing in workers who not only get paid a fair wage. It's not just about a paycheck, right? They have to have the right to bargain. They have to have rights and be respected and be in not just a clean energy job, which, by the way, when we had this conversation 10, 15 years ago, clean energy, green jobs sounded like they were jobs on another planet. They have to be in a career that's buttressed by rights and respect and a recognition for the incredible contribution that folks are about to make in building an economy that can compete in the moment that we're in. And by the way, we got some interagency leaders here who've been advancing our Justice 40 initiative. This cannot be the time when we take, and I, you know, the way I think about the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law is we've got plywood, got hammers and some nails. Now we get to build the clean energy future that we want. And the question is, who is going to benefit from that? Will this great moment of opportunity also leave behind folks who have been looked over and left behind time and time and time again? And by the way, you know, when we talk about climate change and climate action, I think it's a conversation about power. And that's a, a fuzzy term to use at an electrification conference, but I don't mean electricity. I mean who will literally have the power in this moment of transformation in our economy? Who will own the substation assets? Will our utilities step up in a way that returns power to consumers who want to save energy, who want to generate energy and sell that energy onto the grid? Or will they block that change? And I don't mean that as some sort of attack on anybody's business model. Utilities serve us well. They have helped us drive down emissions in the power sector at a pace and speed we haven't seen in other sectors. Now we have to embrace the power of distributed technologies. And we've got to do it in a way, again, that reinforces the workforce that we're going to need to go the distance. And then the last piece that is you can't have a conversation with the president about climate change without talking about this, and that is the solutions for changing, for the changing climate, the clean energy technologies, will be stamped made in America. They will be. And the question is, are we going to wait five years 
for a supply chain crisis. Oh, wait. <laughs> We're actually familiar with this concept. Or are we going to get ahead of the game and harness the full economic opportunity that's in front of us? We talk about heat pumps, talk about electric tractors now. We're talking about literally electricity in every sector of the economy. Industrial processes shifting to electricity. Agricultural processes shifting to electricity. Buildings shifting to electricity. It's not just the power sector anymore, but it's got to be manufactured here in the United States and with support and engagement with our allies and partners. So look, we've, I think, had good dialogue today. Um, I think you've heard from people who know about this transformation, think about it in a way that's perhaps way factor at, you know, 10, 10 to the 10 <laughs> more, more than perhaps I've thought about aspects of this change. Um, but regardless of where you are in this transformation, which role you intend to play, I think it's really important to make sure you're carrying all of these three principles in the back of your mind and make sure they translate into the work that you do. You can choose not to do that, but then we will be a less able partner with you. We will be an able partner with those who feel the sense of urgency that this is the decisive decade and that means the decade for delivery. We will be an able partner with you if you code communities and workers into the work that you do. We will be an able partner with you if you are willing and excited to invest in products stamped made in America. This is our moment of truth. Um, and, you know, I, there's a part of my job where I'm a greenhouse gas accountant. <laughs> and every Every single decarbonization pathway that I look at, every single one, clean electrons flow through the entire thing. They make it happen. So this conversation could not be more important. This time could not be more important. And you could not have a stronger partner in the Oval Office, more excited uh, to work with all of you on all of these objectives. So thank you for being here. Uh, and we're looking forward, as Sally said, to continuing the conversation and translating it into steel in the ground. Thanks, everybody.